Representative Warren? Yes. Just before she does that, could because oh, I hate to do this, but I started. But I okay. Never mind. Um Oh, now I have that. Okay, how about you keep that where it is? Richard, let me give you a call. Okay. Still windy out this way. I don't know about you. <laughs> Nice down in Portland. It's supposed to start getting nice, I guess. So. Did it snow up there? No, not in Albion. We had a little bit of snow yesterday. We just had a just a dusting of it. Yeah. I and heard, it disappeared. Heard they got like a foot up in the county. Wow. Okay, our colleagues are going to take a few minutes to discuss a couple of the bills before we start with them. So plan on a delay of about 10 minutes and then we'll get together. So we're looking at 10.50.
I am lost. I'm lost. I had a thousand phone numbers if I called them down to like 300 and then. I'm stopping at Verizon on my way back to it today again to see what. Senator Searway, if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, give me a call. I've been trying to call you on my cell, but I can't get I can't get through to you. So you've called. Yeah, twice. I've been trying to call you too, and it uh, just keeps going your... to your voicemail. Yeah, just yours does the voicemail. same thing. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's get started. We ought to. I, I think what we what we talked about. Uh, if we have any issues. If you can give me, just give me a quick call and I'll just bring you up to speed on it for, in a couple of minutes because we got to get going, okay? All right. Uh, Mute your mic. Yeah. Representative right. Warren. Yeah. Hi. Can you send me a text? I've lost all my contacts, so I have your number. Oh no, I will right now. I'm wondering if the state legislature should invest in some kind of entertainment for our Zoom participants when we're doing caucus. <laughs> Somebody who comes in and like does like magic tricks. Yeah, something like that, you know, comes out with a top hat and does the song and dance. <laughs> Let them listen into the caucus. They'll probably get a good laugh out of that. <laughs> yes, right? We have a lot of skills. <laughs> Might come with a pretty steep fiscal note, not sure. <laughs> All right. Are people back and ready? Representative Costain, is Representative Pickett there and ready to roll? So one second. Okay. Thank you, uh, Representative Warren. We're all set to go. Wonderful. You're very welcome. Okay, then if everyone can please, um, we'll go through and do our introductions. So good morning. Um, this is the Criminal Justice Committee meeting of Friday, April 23rd. And we'll start with Senator Searway. Good morning, Madam Chair. These these mutes is uh, <laughs> so. I'm Senator Scott Searway, and I represent District 16, uh, which covers Waterville, Winslow, Fairfield, Benton, Albion, and Clinton in Unity Township. Thank you, Senator. Next up, we'll go to Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I apologize to those waiting for the work session to start having to take that little break, but uh, it was a, a must thing for us to do. So thank you very much for your patience. My name is Richard Pickett. I'm uh, 
representative for House District 116, the towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. Thank you, Representative. Next up, Representative Luckner. Morning, I'm Grayson Luckner. I represent District 37, which is part of Portland, neighborhoods of Libbytown, Rosemont, Strawwater, Nason's Corner. Thank you. Representative Morales. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Morales and I represent South Portland in House District 33. And next up, Representative Costain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Dan Costain, District 100, which is part of Etna, Dixmont, Newport, Plymouth, and Corona. Thank you. Representative Newman. Good morning. I'm Dan Newman. Uh, Representing District 76, which is Belgrade, Rome, Mount Vernon, Fayette, Vianna, and Wayne. And Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Bill Pluker from Warren. I represent Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union, House District 95. Thank you. And I'm Representative Charlotte Warren. I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of Manchester and West Gardner. And we are also joined by our committee analyst, Jane Orbiton, and our committee clerk, Deb Fay. Thank you both. And we are going to start off this morning with LD 438. And this is an act to increase public safety by adding a position to the computer crimes unit of the Maine State Police. And I see that Senator Diamond has joined us. So I am going to hand this over first to Jane to see what she has to share with us for information. Welcome, Senator Diamond. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. All righty, this is um, LD 438, an act to increase public safety by adding a position to the computer crimes unit of the Maine State Police. Uh, Deb, thank you. Deb has put up the uh, bill analysis on the screen. The, uh, the bill calls for one position um, to be funded by the highway fund, but at the public hearing, uh, Senator Diamond asked, that uh, the committee make a determination on its own of how many positions it feels and which positions and provide that funding from the general fund. Um, the fiscal note came in on the bill as written and it, um, it looks exactly like the bill because in the, on this bill, the funding was provided in the bill uh, and that was uh, 83,637 dollars in the first year and that's because it's a partial year and 109,000 in the second year. That's all I have. All set. Thank you very much, Jane. Senator Diamond, do you have anything you wanted to share with us? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll be very brief. I know you've got a you know, a long day going. And by the way, I could bring my violin if you want me to at any point to entertain. Oh, see, an added skill. We can uh, have our very own band. <laughs> um, just just a couple of things, just very quickly. Um, since I put this bill together, a lot of changes have happened. And we just found out that the, um, that the cyber tips and the caseload has now uh, expanded ex extensively. Uh, looks like the month of March at 117 new cases. Uh, and at that rate, we'll be up uh, the, this year about 300 more cases than the previous year. So bottom line is it's going, it's going uh, as we don't want it to go, and that is much many more cases. The last thing I would say is uh, I would offer a solution if, it's, if the committee is, um, wanted to consider it, and that is if the committee wants to endorse the, the idea that we need forensic analysts and uh, investigators, uh, and not have to determine the amount. And I'm happy to accept the responsibility to, to go find the money someplace that would be acceptable to you and to the Appropriations Committee and to the legislature eventually. Uh, I would ha I'd happily take that responsibility. So. Thank you, Senator, for that. Questions for Senator Diamond? Yes, Representative Morales. 
Oops, you're muted. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator. Um, given the the new data um, and um, and the need that you've expressed um, this morning, I'm. Has the department changed their position in terms of um, being for uh, this policy change? Um, I've talked with, I haven't talked with the commissioner, but I've talked with Lieutenant Ireland and I believe he's here too, if you'd like to talk to him, but I think he concurs that these numbers really do uh, rise to a different level and that there, is, there should be some uh, responsibility for, for me in particular to um, see if there's people agreement someplace to get some funds to bring some more people on board, namely the analysts and the investigators, whatever, whatever that might, those combinations may end up being. So the answer is I, I really, I've only talked to Lieutenant Ireland uh, and I, and I can say that he's, the numbers came from him. And I think he concurs that this, this is escalating to the point where we, we just can't walk away from it. Okay, thank you. I guess we can ask Lieutenant Ireland that if they're willing to change their um, their uh, testimony to support the policy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Searway. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good morning, Senator Diamond. Good morning. Uh, when you... Uh, when you're saying that you need uh, the forensic and and maybe a detective, are you meaning two positions, or what are you meaning for numbers of positions? Well, I think the uh, thank you for the question, Senator. I think that uh, Lieutenant Ireland expressed last time he was with you when I was on another committee. Um, I think he expressed that I actually should have like seven people. To the backlog now is approaching three years, and we have to remember that these backlog is evidence that the perpetrators uh, and especially the producers and the hands-on offenders are out there until this evidence can be uh, examined and then the investigators uh, do their work. So that's the horrifying thing to me is that the people that have, we have the evidence, we just can't get to it because we don't have the people. And, and my, my sense is, not my sense, my belief is that uh, if we, we cannot let this now go to three year backlog, I think it started out, first of the year is around two probably but because of the escalation. And so I, I really think that uh, we really have to focus on what we have and, and, and again, get as many as we can get. It may be two, Senator, it may be three, I'm not sure. Whatever it is, um, it would be something that it would be, I would have to come up with, find a way to do that, but anyway. And just, just to follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, you may. Uh, so if we got seven uh, personnel, we'll say, um, that's quite a bit of money. Um, and uh, I'm just concerned they, they were trying to take, uh, possibly use my act funds for that. And that was taking intelligence money from one and putting it towards another. And it, it to me, it, it would be very harmful either way. Um, I don't know what your thoughts on that. Well, I, I'm not well versed on other things, especially the MIAC. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even pretend to get involved in that, that debate. All I want to do is focus on finding a way to get some people to deal with that evidence, that hard evidence that sits there while the hands-on offenders in particular are doing their thing, which my God, it's awful. So <clears throat> I would hope that we can, I hope we find a way to get to that. Thank you. Representative Morales, did you want to ask Lieutenant Ireland <clears throat> is here with us? Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, Lieutenant Ireland. Good morning. Um, I, I, you know, hearing the sponsor um, provide us with some new data this morning, given the need, um, has there been discussion within your department about including um, uh, in the change package support for your program in the ways that Senator Diamond is talking about in this bill? There has not been at this point, uh, Representative. Uh, I know initially our response was based on the commissioner and the, and the, uh, the governor's budget and how things would, would fold into that. That has not been addressed recently. So we could certainly go back and try to uh, approach that if you'd like. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. 
Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess this, uh, this question would be for you, uh, for you, uh, Senator. Um, it sounds like the conversations have not uh, been had yet with the, with the uh, Commissioner of Public Safety uh, regards to a funding mechanism for this. At least it sounds like that at this point. And obviously, if Lieutenant, if I'm incorrect, Lieutenant Allen will, will let me know that. But uh, so that being said, uh, when you do have your conversations to try to see what types of funding there might be out there, I I'm all I'm all in on this task force. It's a very very necessary thing. I I, I commend you for your passion and for your desire to want to wanna deal with this, this situation because it is a, a very, very important thing. Uh, but that being said, with where we are right now in our budget process and all of that stuff, it, funding is really something that is kind of the, it's kind of something we don't all really know how this thing is going to all shake out. So my thing is, <clears throat> Would you, would you feel comfortable in part of your conversations uh, talking with the people looking for funding to find out from the governor and from the uh, commissioner of public safety as to some of the vacant but funded positions that they have in their budget, if there was some way that some of them could be used because they're funded positions even though they're vacant. And I know there's other uses that they have for that money. However, if they if we can find enough money through there within the existing budget, then I think you could get a unanimous report out of this committee to fund whatever amount of personnel we could get into this unit to help out. But that's my dilemma. And I just want you to know that I'm all for this, but the funding is really the issue right now for me. Madam Chair, did you want me to respond? Please do. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. My answer is to that. It's a, it's a, that's a good option. Having served on a probes, uh, I, I understand that that particular item works well. But I'm, I'm committed to talk with anybody, including the governor and the commission, anybody else, and I'm committed to come back to you if you want me to, with with some answers in terms of funding options. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm committed and happy to do whatever it takes to get the information. Um, and I'm, again, I'm happy to, to accept that full responsibility if, if that's appropriate or, or you, you can come up with an answer yourself. I'm, I'm happy either way. Thank you very much, sir. Other, uh, yes, Representative Morales, let me just make sure. Representative Morales and Senator Searway. Just to, to um, continue on from re what Representative Pickett um, was just discussing, I feel similarly, and I was thinking about this this morning, um, that perhaps um, the, the best solution for this committee would be to submit a letter to the department, um, you know, expressing our opinion on this and that we'd like to see a change package. And that one option is to um, use um, positions that are currently vacant. That's not the only option, but just as one option for that, instead of passing it as legislation, but recommending it um, moving forward. That's uh, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Um, that's that's fine with me. I mean, I think that's a that's a step that says, look, we, what I would hope that the committee was going to do, and that is, look, we, we acknowledge there is a serious problem here now. Here's one way to get some money, but we, we're not going to. We want you to take a look at those options, this being one. I think that's, I think that's fine. Rep, uh, Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to get um, also some specifics of uh, what positions is actually needed and before we make a decision, because I think we're talking, you know, between one to seven now and, um, and want to find out what the cost would be. And also if, um, 
uh, uh, if everybody's on board, you know, the commissioner uh, and how we're going to get that funding. I guess those are the three things that we really need. Fair enough. Representative Costain. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for the Lieutenant. Uh, sir, thank you for being here today. Uh, my question would be, how many more detectives positions could we put on before we needed another supervisor? I, I'm looking at the, the workforce versus the supervision and workforce together. I mean, uh, the guys that are actually going to be the detective, how many of those can we put on before you need another supervisor? Very good question, Representative. We appreciate it. Um, yeah, so in the initial when the committee asked what it would take for us to get uh, caught up and, and work through our backlog. As you know, the proposal was one sergeant, seven detectives and one planning and research associate. So the span of control to add seven detectives would obviously be significant uh, to try to have, we've got two, uh, two sergeants right now to try to manage the, the caseload. So that's this coming year is looking to be about 1400 complaints. Uh, to be able to manage those search warrants and keep that going. So realistically, um, it's hard to tell. Maybe four more realistically without having to, and that would be certainly extending further than we probably should, but that would be reasonable, I think. Um, just looking at, as Senator Diamond said, the way the calls, we'd like to think that this is a blip in the radar, but unfortunately it's not. Over the last four years, we've seen it increase, and we've seen it just since our last work session. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Diamond mentioned up to 117 in uh, last month. So at that pace, we're looking at 1,400 this year as opposed to 1,100 last year, which last year was a record year from the year before. So it has, does not seem to be dropping off the other side, unfortunately. So therein lies our concern with just trying to be able to certainly address these complaints in a very timely manner. Thank you. Representative Pickett. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Diamond, uh, I think it's pretty obvious by the comments that are being made on both sides of the aisle in this, in this uh, work session that we all understand the importance of this uh, task force. We understand the importance of its relevance and the kind of cases that it deals with. And so that being said, I know uh, that all of us want this to work and we'd love to be able to put our, put our arms around something that, will, that would come out of our committee with a unanimous vote. And in order to do that, I think there is more work to be done on that. And I think, I, I, think I, I hope you will agree with that. And before I make the motion, would you be, would you be uh, acceptable to a motion uh, to uh, either, depending on what kind of time you need either to table this for later in the for later in the in the uh, in the year or maybe even carry it over to next year I, whichever way you want to do it would you be acceptable to one of those motions to give you a chance to work which one works best for you and for the and for the other parties and have those conversations with the with the uh Department of Public Safety with Lieutenant Island and stuff, I would be more, more apt to want to see it be tabled for a while and see if you could work some of that out. Uh, yes, uh, Representative, I'm, I'm happy. I'm pleased, very pleased to do that. And in fact, if, um, if you gave me the opportunity maybe to get that all done in a, in a time that's appropriate to you for this year, for this session, I will do everything I can do to make sure that happens. Um, and if the committee wants to provide that opportunity, I'll certainly take advantage of it and do everything I have to do. Okay, sir, thank you. And uh, I, I, even though discussion will probably still be able to be had, or I'm not sure. Can you discuss after there's a tabling motion? No, hang on okay, a bit. I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that then until we let everybody else have their share of talk, thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you, Representative. I will come back to you to make that motion. Representative Costain. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I can't support this being carried over to the next session. Uh, if we're in the trouble that the Lieutenant is saying we're in, I think we need to give uh, the good Senator uh, 
the amount of time he needs and to try to deal with this with this session. I'm sorry, that's not a question, that's a comment. But. No, this is a work session. So the, the rule about questions are really for public hearings. So you can say whatever you, well, within reason. <laughs> this is a work session. Um, Thank you. So I hear that's why you, I gave you the choice. I hear you, Representative Costain, and it sounds like um, Senator Diamond would like the chance to work on it this year and that we would just table it as opposed to carry it over. Um, so two things I would like to add. Jane, we got from the Department of Public Safety during our budget deliberations, which reminds me we need to schedule getting back to the budget um, in here, but we got from the Department of Public Safety a whole bunch of listing of empty positions. Could we forward all of that material to Senator Diamond? That might be helpful for him as he's doing this work. Additionally, um, I would just suggest to you, Senator Diamond, that you take a look at you know, other places that are being funded um, in the Department of Public Safety. When we looked at and did the math around what's currently being spent on MIAC, um, that funding could fund four detectives and a sergeant each year. So in some ways, if you're unable to find funding and we all see this as such a emergency issue, and I know we do, especially hearing there are 117 new cases since our last work session, um, I would request that you also look at every, you know, department within the, in the, within the, the department and see where the funding is. And is it serving us at the same level that we, that we need with this, with this agency. Um, so that's my suggestion. Those are a couple of two options. Um, anyone else before I ask Representative Pickett to make a motion? Seeing no one else, Representative Pickett. So seeing that I believe the discussion is over, I would like to make a motion to table table this bill uh, and give the good senator the opportunity to get back to us when he's had the chance to get the information he needs to report back to us so we can get it scheduled for this year's session. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Motion to table by Representative Pickett, seconded by Representative Costain. And Deb will call the roll, please. Video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. On the volume. Representative Reckett is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki. Representative Rudnicki. She looks frozen, I'll come back. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent and I'll circle back to Representative Rudnicki. Yes. Thank you. Um, the vote is motion carries with nine yes and four absent. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Senator. And we, Jane, I'm sure will get you that information. Thank you for your time and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for your patience as we got a late start. Thank you, Lieutenant Ireland. Thank you all. I look forward to the entertainment uh, next work <laughs> session from Representative Cook, and we appreciate that offer. So. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah. Okay, so we are on to next 
LD346, an act requiring the use of propane and natural gas detectors. I'm pausing because I don't see Representative Reckitt. Representative Morales, do we did did Representative Reckitt is she needing to be in judiciary today? Yes, she said she's going to be a back and forth. We can let her know um, if she's ready. I can send her a text now. That would be great. Okay. So she's ready to go on this one, I think. Oh, perfect. Okay. So Jane, would you like to start while? Um, we're waiting for Representative Reckitt to join us. Sure, thank you. Uh, this is LD346, an act requiring the use of propane and natural gas detectors. Uh, Deb is putting up the, uh, the bill summary on this and down at the bottom of the page, um, You'll see the proposed amendment from uh, Samantha Warren from the University of Maine system. And it's, uh, it just pertains to where the, where the appliance is that triggers the need for the detector. And the way it currently reads, it reads a building owner shall install or cause to be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's requirements at least one approved fuel gas detector in every room containing an appliance fueled by propane, natural gas, or any liquefied petroleum gas. And the proposal from, uh, uh, from Samantha Warren from the University of Maine system is that fueled by be changed to combust. So it would say in every room containing an appliance that combusts propane, natural gas, or liquefied petroleum gas. I think the difference is that there could be a central location for the actual burner uh, that does the combustion. And so the question is whether the propane, whether the detector has to be in every room that is heated by it or only where the combustion happens. Uh, I have talked with Representative Newman about another um, proposal for this bill and that I know that Representative Reckitt was working on with the fire marshal's office. I don't have anything in writing and um, I don't, I don't feel that I'm the best person to present that to you because I, uh, Representative Newman tried gallantly, but uh, I, I, took, I took notes, but I really shouldn't be presenting the amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jane. Any questions for Jane? Representative Newman, would you be presenting the amendment? Uh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can. Um, what I did is I worked with Rich McCarthy. Uh, he sent me back some language and I had given it to Representative Reckitt and I thought she was going to present it as an additional amendment, but uh, I can, but I noticed she just showed up, so you might want to ask that with her. Wonderful. Representative Reckitt, would you like to present the amendment? Well, I'd love to if I had seen it, but uh, unfortunately I am apparently in the overwhelming backup of my emails, which I thought I had caught up with, but I have not seen the amendment. So I'd be happy if you would present it, uh, Representative Newman. Okay, uh, that's no problem. Um, it's actually the one that I sent you with the language and, and you actually responded to me in email, said yes, we could present it as an amendment. <laughs> okay. So um, basically what it did is it added to the, the language there that we had A, B, C, D. Uh, Rich McCarthy had brought back uh, a, a bullet point E which was mixed occupancy containing a dwelling unit, uh, bullet point F, which is newly constructed business occupancies, uh, G, which would be newly constructed constructed mercantiles, uh, H, newly constructed assembly occupancies, and I, which is existing businesses, mercantiles, and assemblies shall have an effective date 
January 1st, 2020, uh, 2026. Representative Newman, I'm wondering if you could email that to Deb Fay so that she can do a share screen with us, or can you, do you have the ability to share screen where you are? Uh, I don't know if I can share a screen. Okay, if you would. All I, have, all I have is a hard copy, but I did give that language to Jane, so she probably could share those bullet points. Okay. My bullet point notes are really not sufficient for presentation to the committee. Okay, so Deb, you are in the office and Dan, you are in the committee room. Could Deb get that piece of paper? Uh, is there a scanner or some way we can look at this? Yes. Uh, let me run it over to us. Okay. I th I, we're definitely going to need to see it in order to approve it. it it'll take me like five minutes to scan. Yeah. And then, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Representative Newman. Um, while they're getting us that additional amendment, Representative Reckett, are you in approval of Samantha Warren's? Um, yes, I am. Okay, great. Yep. Any committee members have any questions about the amendment by uh, Samantha Warren from the Humane system? Okay, it looks like we're good so far. And once we get a look at this other amendment, um, let me see if we have Sorry, I was. I just got done presenting another bill in judiciary, so I'm happy to be I'm back with you now for the rest of the session. Don't worry. That's the way today has gone for all of us. Jane, are you also a host? I'm not a host today. I was going to bring in the fire marshal. Okay. Does a host have to pay the bill? <laughs> Provide the wine, something like that. No, I'm not. <laughs> little cute little sandwiches. <laughs> I prefer chocolate covered strawberries, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, Representative Newman. Basically, well, while she's uh, scanning that to get it out to everybody, uh, this is what I worked with Rich McCarthy on because being in the fire department, I had some a few concerns that some of this language didn't really go far enough. Um, a lot of restaurants go in with one apartment above them, and the, the uh, language we had didn't really wouldn't work for it. So this is why I went to Rich McCarthy and talked to him a little bit about some other options. Great, thank you for doing that, Representative and Deb. Thank you for being so quick about this. Okay. So you have added mixed occupancies containing a dwelling unit, newly constructed business occupancies. Existing business mercantiles and assemblies shall have an effective date of January 1st. Okay. Okay, Representative Reckett, let's give you the first opportunity to ask questions or speak on this amendment. Um, I'm a little concerned that 26 might be a little far out, um, but I'm not adverse to pushing the, the uh, date out, which I had done last year with the hospitality folks to make sure they had time to combine. And I could live with 26 as opposed to not having the bill pass, um, but it just seems like a long time. I wondered why that was chosen, uh, Representative Newman, the, or uh, Representative McCarthy, uh, whoever, wherever Rich McCarthy is. I mean, did Representative that Newman, can you answer that question? And is Richard McCarthy here? I know we have the fire marshal here, Deb, so maybe we should bring in Joe Thomas, but Representative Newman, would you like to answer the question? I think that the 2026 is actually for existing businesses. New, stuff. New construction all has to be done now as it gets permitted. 
Okay. Existing businesses, I think it was because there was so much concern the last time about the cost of adding things right away. So okay, that's fine. Getting, I, yeah, getting if there were everybody at 26, that would be disturbing, but I could live with that. Okay. Great. Other questions? Good morning, Mr. Thomas, Fire Marshal Thomas, thank you for being here. Would you like to add anything to the discussion? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think the discussion of it's uh, taken place so far is pretty accurate about how the pieces have been put together over time in here. Um, and I think that uh, as uh, Representative Newman put it together, Rich and, and the representative worked, um, to, to put the final details together there. And I, I think we've really got something that meets each one of the stakeholders that we've been involved with uh, some satisfaction in, in uh, what we're getting here for a product in the end. Um, and and uh, to uh, Representative Ricketts' uh, uh, point about the date, uh, when we look at new types of, of implementations uh, you know, uh, uh, a five-year strategy is, is uh, not something that is unique uh, by any means. Obviously, we like things to happen the next day, but um, in our cold world, that's, that's very consistent with uh, uh, how we operate uh, with plans of correction and so forth uh, already. Thank you. Thank you for that. Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move ought to pass as amended. I second. Second. We have a motion ought to pass as amended by Representative Pickett, seconded by Representative Morales. Yes, Jane. Could I just ask um, if uh, uh, the fire marshal could just um, clarify in his language, it was that business entities would be delayed until 2026 for uh, existing. And I just don't, I need clarification whether A, B, C, D, and the new E on mixed occupancy, are those all business entities? No, the, the businesses, mercantiles, and assemblies are going to be separate. Those are the ones which are actually identified in subsection E. Okay, thank you. All set, Jane? Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? Great, seeing none. Deb, would you call the roll, please? Certainly. Video on, please, and unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt. Yes. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. I will circle back. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costine. Yes. Representative Rudnicki. Yes. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent. And I'll circle back to Representative Luckner. Representative Luckner is absent. So that's nine yes. For absent, the motion carries. Thank you, Deb. And thank you, Fire Marshal Thomas and others who worked on this bill with Representative Newman and Representative Reckitt. Congratulations, you've been working on this for a while. So thank you. Okay, great. Um, so we are still waiting on the CLAC bills of which there are two from CLAC and one regarding CLAC. Oh, Mr. Pelletier is here. Um, let's see, Director Landry is here as well. So let's go to LD58. And Deb and Jane, I'll give you a second to switch to that bill.
LD58 is an act to improve information sharing by criminal justice agencies with government agencies for investigating child or adult abuse. Wow, very quick, Deb, thank you. And we have the analysis. And go ahead, Jane, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, this is LD58. I think, you know, given that uh, some of these bills we've done a number of times, but uh, also we're, uh, we have a lot of bills to do today. So I won't read you through the bill analysis unless you particularly want it. Um, I do not have any additional materials since the, uh, the time that we met before on work session or since the public hearing. Uh, and um, I guess we've heard there are some people here if you need additional information. That's all I have. Wonderful, thank you, Jane. Great, so as you all know, um, a few of us have been working on this bill uh, alongside the Department of Health and Human Services and specifically Dr. Todd Landry and Molly Bogart um, and attorney Chris Parr from the Department of Public Safety as well as some other staff members from within the Office of Child and Family services. Um, some of us uh, re remain or have had concerns about the, the sort of new standard of shared information that is not criminal charges, excuse me, that is not criminal conviction, um, but opposed, but instead it's uh, investigatory materials and information. So um, we've all, as I said, met numerous times and had great conversations. One of the things that recently, um, that came up at a recent discussion is that also the department had established a, a sort of information sharing relationship with the judiciary. And, um, and in that process between the department and the judiciary now exists a memo of understanding that sort of puts some guardrails around what information is shared from the judiciary to the department. And um, because of a lot of great work by these departments and by the judiciary, we have now received a copy of that um, MOU and I just got it and I wanna send it. Um, Molly, do you know, could we bring over Molly Bogart and Director Landry? Certainly. Thank you, Deb. And I don't wanna leave anybody out. Let me make sure that we're not. Uh, also, Ms. Johnson is here. Chris Parr is here. I think that. Jane, I'm sending you the memorandum of understanding that we've just received so that you can make sure that all of the committee members have it. Um, if you would be so kind to do that, thank you. Uh, hi, Molly. Hi, everybody else. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you all for being so willing to have these continuous meetings with us as we try to craft a policy that meets your needs, but also protects, um, you know, protects Mainer's information. Um, so that's a lot of information that I just gave to committee members. I personally need a little bit of time to uh, process this MOU that we received and I know you all will as well. And I also want to state that as Molly shared with me and all of us in the group earlier, the thing that would make it a little more difficult is that while the Department of Health and Human Services can create a single memorandum of understanding with the judiciary, there would need to be possibly multiple 
MOUs between the department and criminal justice agencies. The one thing that I thought of quickly was that a lot of that may be able to be taken care of if there was an MOU promulgated from the Criminal Justice Academy, right, to all the agencies, you know, if there was sort of standard language. That was my thinking. I'm not sure that's going to help us, but I just put that forward. So that's where we are. First of all, I want to open it up to um, committee members to ask any questions that you have about the process that we're going through. Um, and then I think we're going to ask for another tabling for this bill so that we have more information um, to digest what the MOU, with the guidelines that the MOU has provided. Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, it's kind of hard for for uh, me to and those of us that don't have the MOU in front of us to to know what it said, what it actually says, and whatever. But one thing I want to make sure is not being lost in the discussion here, uh, and that is the fact that uh, this information sharing we can't lose fact. We we may not want something to be given out there because of a potential, uh, how do I want to put this? I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose the fact that our goal is to help people that are, that are being involved in possibly being abused, neglected or exploited. That's our, that's our real focus here. And it must be our real focus, focus on the victim, the victim that's being abused, neglected, or exploited. And in order to do that, if this information is information that we can get out that is going to help the investigatory agencies to do that, regardless whether it's DHHS or, or whoever, that information needs to get in the hands of the people that are going to be able to investigate properly these cases to make sure that the end result is the victim of the case is getting the proper investigation done to help help the exploitation, the abuse of the neglect to cease. And that's that's something I just want to make sure that before I can get wrap my arms around this and 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 vote on this, I need to make sure that, that piece is really being tuned in on. So that being said, I don't know. I'll I'll start out by asking if I could the question to Mr. Landry, and maybe he can address that. And if not, maybe there's somebody else here that could better address that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Landry, for being here. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for having me. And, and thank you for the question, your comments, uh, Representative. Um, I'm Todd Landry. I'm the Director of the Office of Child and Family Services in the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and I do want to say, you know, we have, um, you know, my thanks to Representative Warren, Representative Morales, uh, my colleagues within DHHS and, and Mr. Parr. Uh, I think we have tried, we've had a few meetings to talk about how we can address some of the concerns that uh, that were evidenced in the in the hearing in the work session, um, we have proposed an amendment, and I know this is not uh, available for all of you. We have proposed an amendment for your information that would narrow the scope to specific chapters uh, of violations to attempt to narrow the scope of what we are looking at, uh, specifically to those chapters that involve uh, specific harm to. Uh, children or adults who are being uh, abused, neglected, or exploited. Um, we think that uh, it's our opinion that that is an appropriate way to move forward um, to meet the aims that Representative Pickett uh, just clearly articulated from the safety perspective, in my case for children, or in our fellow office case for adults. Um, we do recognize there may still be some concerns, but when we focus our attention around ensuring that we have uh, and using, and I'll refer you back to the examples we've given in work session and in the hearing, when we focus on that aspect of uh, access uh, to those investiga investigative records um, as one component 
of the overall investigation that we um, that we pursue or, or process in an allegation of abuse or neglect, uh, we think it will um, you know help us keep kids uh, more children safe and and ensure that we're able to meet our statutory duty. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, I'm not sure if the committee is going to table or not. Of course, that's your decision. Um, but uh, at some point, we look forward to perhaps being able to share that amendment with you um, uh, or perhaps another, another vehicle. We do have the concerns about the MOU approach because it would require us to uh, have MOUs with every single, as I understand it, every single law enforcement agency uh, in the state that, that could make this uh, much more challenging versus uh, a statutory provision that we've proposed or that um, Maine State Police has proposed. So hopefully that helps to answer some of your questions, but I appreciate your, your um, willingness to, to give me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director Landry. Next up, I have Representative Morales and then Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, Dr. Landry and your team. I do appreciate all the back and forth um, that we've had to understand and maybe um, narrowly tailor um, it, but I, I don't see that we are narrowly tailoring it from what has been offered so far. Um, and I do understand that um, there are some statutes that have been put in place to sort of guide what we're talking about, but we're still talking about opening all documents and all records related to anything investigated by criminal um, justice agencies. Um, so that's the, that's the real concerning piece to me legally, you know, because if someone um, has an investigation opened and there's uh, some information written in a police record, and as you know, it takes a little bit of time for adjudications to happen in the court to actually make a final decision. However, if decisions are made um, based on that and later on it's found that, you know, it's not credible um, in the court of law and there's no crime um, committed, you know, that's sort of the balance where I see Representative Pickett's point of, of course we wanna protect children. Of course we wanna save lives. We also, want to protect privacy and we want to make sure that, um, you know, folks aren't uh, adjudicated before they're adjudicated in the court of law. So as I look at, at where we still are, you know, the law, as I've always had concerns about it, um, allows sharing of investigative records for anything related to um, child abuse. So before an adjudication is made, if there is investigation of child abuse, that is allowed to be shared. But I never understood for the last 15, 20 years, why if the child was not present when domestic violence is happening in the home, why that couldn't also be open uh, for investigative purposes. And that's sort of the, I think the gap where I feel the most comfortable in in opening a little bit of a doorway here um, to allow investigative records where the child's not present in the home, but there's there's domestic violence reports in the home. And we all know we've heard how difficult it is to get a domestic violence charge. We know how difficult it is for folks to bring those cases. We know that 14,000 domestic violence cases go unreported in the state. So, as we really think and work hard on this, and I'm interested in looking at the MOU, I am talking with practitioners as well. Um, still very uncomfortable with open, opening up all these records for all those reasons, but I do have that small compromise um, that I think would make a big difference in the life of children related specifically to abuse going on in the home. So thank you, and I'm sorry to go on for so long. Thank you, Representative Morales. Um, Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess this question goes to uh, Chris Parr. Uh, I appreciate you being involved in this about the records. Um, I just kind of wonder, it, it must be quite a, a challenge trying to figure out how much records you can release and what you can't 
so that uh, doesn't get to be too many hands in the pudding, you might say. I, I just don't want to see a, a, a case that's been being worked on uh, get disrupted. And sometimes if you get too many people involved, somebody finds something out or whatever, that can disrupt a case. And that's what I don't want to see. Um, so what's your thoughts on that? Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you all uh, for uh, for the ch chance to be here. Um, every um, every case and every uh, request for records that we receive in this context, we have to look at and evaluate um, based on um, the, the facts presented um, by that particular situation. Um, and um, you know, if if a request relates to a pending investigation, um, we have to be uh, very mindful of of whether or not the release of certain information will potentially uh, undermine the criminal investigation, um, you know, to which the records relate. Uh, bear in mind that the the provision of law that we're that we're talking about is Title Sixteen, Section Eight Hundred Six, and that is is um, it allows the disclosure of intelligence and investigative record information. And I'll just call it, it allows the disclosure of police records, just to make it easy, subject to reasonable limitations. And what that means is that uh, re the records can be disclosed, but redactions have to be made in, in, in most, if not all cases. Uh, records most certainly have to be uh, and will be withheld. Uh, so that there's not uh, over disclosure, including to ensure that uh, privacy uh, interests are protected. And the other thing that I, I guess I'm trying to understand the concerns a little bit better generally that are being voiced, because keep in mind that Section 806, the, the same provision that we're talking about amending through this bill, is the same section where victims uh, of crimes are able to get records subject to reasonable limitations as well. And there are absolutely no, uh, unlo unlike DHHS, there, there are absolutely no restrictions on what they can do once they get that information. Once they get it, they could, they could put it up on the internet if they wanted to. So, and as, as, someone, who, as, as someone who personally has concerns about privacy related matters, that concerns me personally myself. So, but we're not, you know, so just I hope that gives some context to what we're talking about. The the the, the provision also covers uh, the ability of of uh, domestic violence advo uh, 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 victim advocates and sexual assault uh, uh, victim advocates to get uh, information again subject to reasonable limitations. But built into the statute and in, into uh, Section 806 under that provision are are um, certain restrictions on what they can do with the information, how, how long they can have it, um, and so on and so forth. So that there, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, certainly, we, we are very sensitive to the, the possibility of, of uh, you know, releasing too much information uh, can always uh, have the effect of undermining a, a potential prosecution, and we certainly wouldn't want that to happen. So, so just to follow up, yes, Madam Chair. So, uh, do you feel that this amendment is going to be uh, clear enough so that it doesn't do harm to our, the, the victims? Which amendment are you talking about? Are you talking about the one that we had worked on together? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Well, I, I guess I, I look to Office of Child and Family Services. Uh, I, I look to them in, in terms of, okay, what, what, what type of information, what kind of situations is it that in, in your judgment, you need the type of information to best inform your, your investigations to make sure that kids and vulnerable vulnerable adults are safe and protected, and and we've had that conversation, and we said, okay, we can we can we are not they're not really worried about you know public administration type type crimes you know, but serious crimes for obvious reasons they are concerned about, 
And so we, you know, we made a good faith effort uh, and, and they, they went about, you know, made an effort to do that, understanding the concerns, but also understanding that this very serious uh, conduct that they want to, I think, want to try to account for amongst a, a, a universe of other information that they have to try to account for in their investigations to make sure that, that you know, children are safe and vulnerable adults are safe. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what we worked toward together in, in drafting the amendment that we came together on. Um, I, I don't know, and I'm trying to imagine what uh, an MOU situation would be like. I, it would, so far as I can see, the concern I would have certainly is the idea of how would it be practically implemented and understanding that there may be occasions when we might have to share information because of our, uh, because of, you know, we have a neighbor of New Hampshire, they might have an investigation that we might have to share uh, investigative information with the equivalent of their OCFS. And, you know, are they going to have to, or, you know, we, I, I suppose you'd have to have MOUs with that agency as well. Yeah, I'm trying, I, I haven't really thought it through, but I'm not sure how practical that is. I'd rather see something in statute because at that point, everyone's on the same page, you know, um, and everyone can look at the same thing and we have it. And that, and that was the nice thing. And that is the nice thing about the provision regarding uh, sexual assault victim advocates and domestic violence uh, victim advocates that's in uh, section 806 currently in subsection four. There are those actually uh, built right in um, I believe prior to that, I believe there, the, the provision actually said there had to be an MOU and then eventually they were put in statute, uh, at least the major provisions. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Next, I have Representative Reckett and then Representative Morales. Let me just quickly speak to the MOU issue because uh, when the agency I used to run um, launched on a, a <clears throat> program where the police would share their crime, re their reports of domestic violence um, calls to our staff to see if we, uh, there were victims who needed to be contacted for assistance. Uh, it was complicated. We had uh, MOUs with every police department in, the, in Cumberland County. And those didn't come quickly or uniformly or instantly. In fact, there was uh, one department where they held up for three or four years without signing an MOU. So we couldn't help anybody in that way in that community. So MOUs of that sort are a pain in the butt. But um, the other piece, um, what I had originally raised my hand to talk about was the, uh, the whole issue of children in the home in domestic violence circumstances. And I'm not sure I understood um, Representative Morales' um, last um, series of uh, comments on that, because I and I and I could have heard you wrong, but my concern has always been that um, oftentimes uh, there are children in the home, and the police uh, either don't take note of it because the kids are upstairs asleep, supposedly, um, and uh, I mean kids who are around that. Um, peace uh, do get impacted. They do hear things. Uh, they do see things, uh, even if you don't think they did. So um, I'm concerned about the impact of children, I guess, in the house uh, at the time of an assault, for instance, is the clearest one, uh, rather than uh, just dismissing that because they're not, you know, right there in the moment. So I think it's, that's a tricky piece that makes me nervous because I want to make sure that we protect those kids as well. So uh, I don't know what the answer to the th piece is and I haven't seen the MOU yet. And I, you've heard some of my concerns about MOUs in general, but um, <clears throat> I'd be happy to look at this thing again and, and see, uh, you know, see how we move. Thank you, Representative. Attorney Parr, I think what you shared as a process that was previously utilized where there were MOUs with, I think you shared concerning 
sexual assault and domestic violence agencies, and then those MOUs became part of the statute. That's exactly what we're thinking about, is how do we use the guardrails that you have created with, through an MOU with the judiciary? Could we use similar guardrails to protect this information and put it in statute? so that the process is still exactly what you're looking for, statute, a change in statute, but we're utilizing the examples set forth by what, how the judiciary negotiated this with the department. Does that, does that make sense? It, it it does. I, I've only, I understand what you're saying. It, it, I, I thought, I understood it to be that there would actually be MOUs. I didn't understand it was actually going to be put, put in the statute. If that's the case, I, I guess my thoughts are, are a couple. Um, as I recall, and Representative Reckitt might have a better recollection, the, the MOUs that ended up being codified, or, the, or the, the key provisions of which ended up being codified, were maybe one, two pages, I wanna say, it's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, and they were boiled down to what is currently, I think, uh, eight, section 806, subsection four. Um, the, the MOU I saw today and did not read through it because uh, I just saw it, I think was 10 pages. Um, so I, I guess for, I, I would need to know kind of, okay, of the 10 pages um, or, or and maybe I don't even know if, if what the concerns are that there are, are addressed in that MOU. Um, so I guess for me, as, in terms of, if I were to try to draft this, I would need to know, okay, what, what are the concerns? <clears throat> Is it the concerns about, you know, the types of records, uh, how the records are used, the, you know, the duration for which they're kept, you know, who gets to, who gets to see them, you know, those types of, you know, what, what is it that we would want to address in such a, you know, statute that would be almost like section 806 subsection four. Um, and, and then I could, you know, I'd be happy to try myself to even draft something like that, but to do so, I would need, I would need to know that. And that's what I'm unclear on. Thank you for that. I'm happy to have another meeting and share what those concerns are again around, um, I think you stated a few of them. Um, again, I think what the original proposal does is opens up a free flow of information, unfettered, everything. What we are trying to do is put some guardrails around what that information is in a similar way to what other agencies have done when they've shared information with the department. It seems to me that this MOU provides some examples of those guardrails. And so maybe once we all get a chance to digest it and ascertain what parts, you know, are examples of how we might shield or, or craft uh, a way to protect some of this information, we could put it into the amendment that you already worked on and that we appreciate so much and bring that back to the committee and see if we can get unanimous support around it if we can get something that also supports the needs of the Office of Child and Family Services. Did that make more sense? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm certainly happy to meet and continue the conversation. Um, I, I, I would, I, I guess I would be interested in hearing what my, what my colleagues at OCFS, Please, yes. see what their thoughts are. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Landry. Uh, we're happy to continue to meet and try to see if we can get something that will, you know, adequately protect, um, you know, children uh, from my perspective or other vulnerable individuals. Um, 
that we're charged with uh, protecting. And um, so we'd be happy to, to see if we can come up with something and, and get something back in front of the committee if possible. Thank you, Dr. Landry. Um, Molly, how about you, anything to add? No, I, I think that that's, I think that's fine. You know, I, we are um, certainly challenged by, I think not being comfortable limiting much more the type of content than what we've proposed in the amendment, but are always more than happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Questions from committee members. Yes, Representative Morales. Yes, I'm sorry. And I know I've asked this before, but it still is really not clear what the amendment limits. Can someone explain that really clearly um, so that we can understand what the current amendment on the table limits? Yes, I can. Thank you, Representative Warren. Uh, you know, specifically, what we have proposed to limit uh, our access to records based on the chapters of, of, the, uh, of the criminal code. So uh, it is still a relatively long list of chapters, but I'll very quickly do that just for the education or information of the committee members. We think all of these have a direct linkage to potential protection issues of children, for example. Uh, so that would be, you know, chapter nine, offenses against the person, including homicide, assault, and terrorizing. Chapter 11, sexual assaults. Chapter 12, sexual exploitation of minors. Chapter 13, kidnapping, criminal restraint, and criminal forced labor. Only section 506B of 21, uh, but uh, and we single out 506B in the offenses against public order because that is violation of a protective order. Chapter 23, offenses against the family. Chapter 33, arson and property destruction. Chapter 35, sex trafficking, prostitution. Chapter 41, criminal use of explosives and related crimes. Chapter 43, weapons. And chapter 45, drugs. So if the offense falls in any of the other chapters that I didn't just list, we would not have access to those. We did not feel like those chapters had that very clear linkage to potential child safety issues, which is why we listed these specific chapters. So that was our proposal to limit the information that OCFS or uh, investigative bodies uh, such as ours could receive. Um, and I believe, um, I'll share my personal view, looking at just the names of those examples and the names of those chapters, I think uh, we can, I certainly believe very strongly those have a direct linkage to potential child safety issues um, that we would want to have access to the rest investigative records on. So thank you for that indulgence. Yeah, and thank you so much because um now I'm understanding more about what the amendment is. I know you've listed the chapters, but I never had a, a, a clear understanding and I frankly didn't have the time to go through the code. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I think what I wanna know a little bit more about is um, the section 506B offenses of public order and the offenses against the family and then drugs. Obviously that's a big one because of stigma and what I've expressed to you all about the work I do with moms um, who are recovering from substance use disorder and on that path to recovery, um, hoping that they don't lose their children. Um, so that's really my biggest concerns, but some of the other ones I, I, you know, I think you make a very good case for. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to looking at that MOU and continuing these discussions. Thank you, Representative. Anything further on this bill? Okay, I'd entertain a motion. Oh yes, Senator DeChambeau. Hey there. I wanna thank uh, both um, Chris Parr and Dr. Landry. I think I'm following him. We just left the committee together. Um, that was very helpful at the end. And thank you, Representative Morales for asking that question. It's It specifies and it seems to to go along, there's a lot of work in that. Just looking at the criminal code and for you guys to pick up those things, that's a lot of work. So thank you again. Thank you, Senator. I'd entertain a motion. I make a motion to table. Second. 
Motion made by Representative Morales, seconded by Senator Searway. And I'll step back so Deb can call the roll. Video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt. Yes. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costine. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau. Yes. That's um, 11 yes and two absent. So the motion passes. Great. Thank you very much, Deb. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Absent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Director Landry, Ms. Johnson, um, Attorney Parr, Molly. Thank you all for being here. You're very welcome. And uh, Senator DeChambeau, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to spare you from seeing me anymore for the rest of the day. So, but uh, thanks for being on both of your committees uh, with me today. Thank you. That's okay. You. We haven't seen each other for a few months and this is good. Good day today. Thank you. Madam Great. Chair. Yes. Good. Just for uh, record keeping, who made the motion and who seconded it? Uh, Representative Morales made the motion and Senator Searway seconded it. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Okay. So we have left the bills dealing with the Criminal Justice Academy. Um, LD 1175, excessive telephone video and commissary charges, and then the three CLAC bills. Senator DeChambeau, do you have any uh, feeling about where you'd like to go next? I'm looking to see uh, if- I do. Yeah. Yes, Representative. I, uh, it's uh, 10 after 12, and I think some of these will go fairly quickly this afternoon. If we broke for like a half an hour and then get started and get our afternoon work done, that would be great. Are you saying the bill you want to work on next is lunch? That's correct. And I have about, <laughs> I have uh, two seconds in the room with me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll take a half hour break. Does that work for you, Senator? I, you yeah. know, this is the first time he's up me. The question was directed to the senator representative, but that's okay. She so, was running the meeting. She was running the meeting, Senator. That's why I went to the chair. Thank you. <laughs> I was asked my opinion first. We're all set. Okay. Um, I did talk to Representative Pickett before, so I know what his, his preferences are, and I agree with him. Thank you. Great, so we're planning to be back at 1240. Um, Representative, uh, Senator Warren, may I ask, uh, we're going to do, what is it, 1175, the phone and commissary, is that it? You wanna do that one next when we come back? Well, um, I think um, Commissioner Liberty uh, wants to make himself available and I'd like to schedule, I'd like to be able to tell him a certain a date, a time certain. Okay, great. Let's do 11.75 when we return at 12.40. And then how about if we do the three bills having to do with CLAC? All right, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, have a nice lunch, everyone.
Jane, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. Did you see the little email I sent you about my chip yeah, bill? I, yeah, I but just wrote. I just wrote you back. Of course, we're. Um, I caution you. We're not having a private conversation. Uh, no, no, I mean, I'll yeah. tell. No, no, I, I will just tell you. I just got off the phone with Dan Stevenson, and uh, he's going to talk with them. I didn't want to do anything without commissioner knowing about it. The, right. Okay. So I think. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Still windy outside. It's amazingly windy out there. Yeah. It's supposed to get warm this weekend, though. Nice. I'm ready for some barbecue weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm on my lawn here pretty quick. <laughs> It's one of the many things I love about living in a condo. Mm. No lawn mowing. I love lawn mowing. It gets I, me out. I don't have a lawn. I have water. That's it. <laughs> there you right. go. It, it's amazing, uh, Senator Sirway. Just looking out, mm. I don't see land. I'm right on top of a waterfall. Isn't that something? It wow. Is amazing. Yeah, I don't miss mowing the lawn. I don't think I've mowed the lawn in 40 years. Well, ever since my son was born. <laughs> Senator. 12 years old. I bought him a lawnmower. <laughs> Senator. Yes. That's why you have to have flowers inside because you don't, you can't have hey, them outside. Listen, did you see these? I, I did see them. Wait, they're, you know what? Look how beautiful. These are from Senator Benner's um, garden. She made a bouquet for every single senator last night on wow. the Earth Day. Oh my I God. Gotta, I got to go look at mine. I've got them on my windowsill. I haven't even looked, had a chance That's, to look at them. Even Senator Searway got a bouquet. That's right. That's so great. That is so great. I love that. Are there some tulips in there? Yes. Yeah, I mean, they're like heirloom. They're old roses, like, you know, and. Wow. Yeah. I Did think, somebody send her a link? <laughs> I think, Oops, uh, what's sorry. his name? Um, Senator Bennett gave us, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if Greg Hickman was involved. We got, oh, look at his flowers. Look at yeah, that. it came out nice. Beautiful. We got a little, um, coffee mug with thyme or mint or parsley. Yeah. So, wow. so I'm going to bring whippy pies for, for Wednesday's meeting. <laughs> Senator. Perfect. Yes. Oh, she answer me. She is. <laughs> yeah, Senator. Uh, I uh, was just made aware that the sponsor for this bill I was unable to get in because she doesn't have the link. Is there any way that I could, uh, we could get that link sent to her? Um, it's uh, Representative Mary Ann Kenny. Yeah, I would think, uh, Deb, did you hear that? Yes. And Thank you. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I told her that. Yeah. Mike's on. 
Susan, I think your background should be of the waterfall in front of you. I don't know how I can do that. I'm on the sixth floor. I'm overlooking everything. So um, I, I'll have my son take a picture of it and maybe I can have it as a background. I don't know. So. When I was on about 12 years old on a Sunday drive with my parents through the rural areas, there was a house for sale. My father stopped to take a look at it and it had a waterfall. And I said then I would always, I would have a waterfall. They couldn't believe I got one. So. That's awesome. It must be so nice for sleeping. And then you hear Amtrak at night. I like that. I feel like I'm in the middle of the woods or something. <laughs> I've told you all about the ongoing sort of thing that's happening in my community with the rooster. Sorry, I don't know why I find it so funny, but somebody got a rooster. I get up at four, so it doesn't bother me, but oh my goodness, it is it's the, my favorite condo communications that are going on. <laughs> There's nothing like hearing a rooster crow in the morning. I love it. It reminds me of growing up on a farm, which is where, yeah. I, you know, where I grew up. When, when I uh, head out in the morning, the rooster's crowing and the cows are mooing and it's like. <laughs> nice. Hi, Mary like Ann. Oh, Representative McKinney, I should say. Hi, Hello. Hello, Senator. How are you? Great. Miss, miss you over on VLA. Oh, I know. And, and of course, state and local last session. <laughs> I know. I've moved around, I'm telling you. And no, I was so, so do I. <laughs> I That's what I hear. She... Forward oh. to working with uh, Senator Lachini again. So, oh, oh well. <laughs> and we're dealing with all the marijuana bills this morning. This oh, is... well, of course. You've got Craig Hickman there to help you. So, <laughs> We yep. were on the committee together. Yes, well, we have Patrick Corey and Jay McCrate too. Oh, so we're right. also MLI committee. Um, uh, Representative Warren, do you want to continue? I, I am in the middle of two things right now. So I might get called out. So Okay, sure. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, everyone, so welcome back and welcome to Representative Kinney for thank your you. bill, uh, LD 1170, 1175, an act to prohibit excessive telephone, video, and commissary charges in Maine jails and prisons. And Jane sent us the bill analysis, and we'll let Jane start off. Okay, uh, I would say um, in case you want to see what's in the bill analyses forms and the scrolling isn't working for you or you want to go back to a different one, I did send them all to you this, uh, this morning, right before the meeting. So you have an email that has them individually. Um, this is LD 1175. Uh, the bill about excessive telephone, video, and commissary charges in Maine jails and prisons. Um, the I won't go through the bill. It's you. You have a lot to do today, uh, and I'm sure everybody remembers the testimony. I'll just bring up a couple of questions that people asked, where they asked for information. Um, and uh, sort of new issues that were brought up. There was an issue brought up about a $4 cost of call and collect and a $2 connection charge. There was also a question about a $3.40 transaction fee when money is added to a resident's account. Uh, Commissioner Liberty was asked for information about the inmate benefit fund revenues and expenses, and for a copy of the contract with Securus. Uh, you were sent yesterday or today uh, the uh, information on the inmate benefit fund. 
uh, expenses and on the balance uh, and also the contracts. I don't believe one is with Securus. And I don't know if the department contracts with Securus and we didn't get that one or the ones we got cover the same uh, services that a Securus contract would cover. Uh, and Sheriff King was asked for information about uh, York County Jail, uh, how much is generated for the jail from phone calls, whether they use Securus, a copy of the contract, revenues and expenses from the inmate benefit fund, and whether there's a transaction fee for money uh, being added to the inmates account. The uh, other issue that I would bring up for you is that attorney Robert Ruffner uh, suggested to you adding to the bill that inmates have the right to free phone calls to their attorneys. That's all I have. Oh, he did at the end of the, uh, thank you, Deb. At the end of the bill analysis is uh, information from Mr. Ruffner about what other states do with regard to inmate um, free telephone calls to attorneys. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Jane, for that. And I know that we have the commissioner here to provide us with some information as well. So maybe Deb, you could bring over Commissioner Liberty. And then before, um, as she's doing that, questions for Jane from the committee. Jane, did we receive the information from Sheriff King? I did not. I don't believe I received anything. He may be here. I think he's here today, or he was at least in the waiting room. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. If Sheriff King is here, that would be great as well. So did you say that we did, and I'm sorry that I haven't seen this, we did receive the information from the department? We did, and um, also this morning, I got some information from Courtney Allen on phone call, uh, the cost of phone calls in jails and prisons. I don't know if you received that. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so first we'll start with questions and I have Senator Searway and Representative Pluker to start. Uh, I had a question for Jane, I'm sorry to be a little late. Well, oh yeah, that's, that's fine, please. Do, was your question also for mm -hmm. Jane, Senator Searway? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Senator Searway and then Representative Pluker. Uh, Jane, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jane, I just uh, was wondering, is there a penalty if we paid for the phone calls? Is there a penalty, uh, you know, as far as the benefits that they get? The, would we have to pay that as well? I mean, because it seems like if you take and you pay one, then the benefit isn't going to go to the other. So we have a problem there. So what's your take on that? I just wanted to hear from what your thought was on that. I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. If, if you, if the jails changed or the person. Right, so if we're paying the phone, phone call and then part of that money goes to a benefit for the prisoners, mm -hmm. And they don't get that benefit. So would we have to pay for the benefit too? So that's what I'm wondering how that works. I, I, my understanding is that the inmate benefit fund is administered um, within the institution. Uh, but if, so if you change the law or if the institutions changed how they run, so that less money comes into the inmate benefit fund, there would be less money to pay for those purposes. Okay, thank you. Representative Pluker. Thank you. I, then Jane, Biz, you also sent an email today uh, for today's info resident account funds re regarding LD 1175. And are, so is that fund balance we see there of the one 
$1.7 million. Is that what is currently in the IBS account? Um, I, I, I don't know that came from the department of corrections. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it does say as of 422, um, but you, we should have to talk with them about it. Oh, I just hadn't seen that client trust fund terminology before. So I was wondering if that was the same as the IBF terminology, but we can ask them. Thank you. Okay. Welcome Commissioner Liberty. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I may, I can uh, answer that question for Representative Pluker. Um, that would be great. If you look at that document that indicates um, the, um, it says uh, the client trust total and the facility in which it uh, originates, the uh, 1.7 um, million is what the residents have in their own individual accounts. So that's like their savings account. And so collectively, and you can see that document indicates that at uh, BCF is uh, 341,000, uh, Long Creek has 4,000. And then I, we've broken it out to show you exactly per resident what the average is, what they have in their accounts. Um, and those revenues can be everything from uh, at the, like, like at uh, Baldwin Correctional Facility and at Mountain View, they're working. And so they come back and, and they put that in their savings account. Um, others may be coming from money they brought from the outside or from family members, but that's the money that's their working money as though we would have our own checking or savings account that we manage for them. Um, I've also broken that up to, um, you know, how many residents we have in each one of those facilities. And um, one of the, one of the uh, obvious uh, uh, concerns for all of us is how many indigent, how many individuals have nothing in their account. And I've broken that down to by facility. So you can see just exactly who may have um, nothing in, in their account. In addition to that, I'd like to, um, uh, I have another document that was prepared for you that indicates exactly where the money was, was spent last year. And uh, many of these um, topics, it's, a, it's the document that uh, calendar year 2020 benefit expense by category. It's that, it's that um, Excel, Excel spreadsheet. And uh, you'll see that the main Department of Corrections last year spent $908,000 of the IBF on um, about 15 or 20 different items uh, caring for the residents uh, that are in our custody. And you can see that uh, one of the major expenses is, um, is cable. We spend $138,000 for individuals to have cable in their individual cells. And so as you're aware, um, as you've toured our facilities, you've seen that uh, they have the ability to buy a television set. And when they do that, just like us, it, it makes a more normative environment for them. When they have off time, when they're not working, when they're not programming, they can return to their cell and um, they can watch um, um, many different uh, channels. And so um, that pays for that, that's free to them. Um, we also have um, uh, things like uh, gate money. People are released and they're given some money to, to, to transition if they don't have any. Um, housing, which I know um, some of you are, are very um, attentive to. We spent $64,000 to assist individuals transitioning from the Maine Department of Corrections to provide them some temporary housing, sometimes putting them up in a hotel for a period of time until they can transition. Mm -hmm. um, something that's really important to me and I know to you is that um, if you look down at the resident salaries and stipends, we provide uh, 239 jobs for the residents. Um, that are paid for directly out of the IBF. And those are things providing uh, uh, tutors or, or peer mentors. Um, it could be uh, any number of things that, uh, that provides uh, direct assistance to the residents. and gives them that, that opportunity to work. And um, as you know, you know, some of those jobs pay um, a variety of, of levels of pay, but it allows them to, um, when they're, they're in a facility, uh, a locked facility in particular, not in the minimums, it gives them an opportunity to pay down their their restitution to the victims, fines, um, you know, to save some money. And so when they do exit, or they, they are able to go to a minimum if they are, um, they're able to build that account. And we have uh, some individuals leave, leaving with a considerable amount of money. Um, also, you'll see postage. Um, we have a total of um, $30,000 in postage that we provided for the individuals um, to, um, if they didn't have postage, um, we give them free uh, stamps to, to release. So if you look down through there, these are real quality of life, sort of normative uh, 
um, creating um, expenses that uh, allow them to have a uh, good quality of life while they're there. And uh, that's what we spend our money on. Again, all the money that's taken from um, any of these resources all go back to the residences. And I just thought it was important that you had a, a clear understanding um, if the, the unintended consequences of, of a loss of any revenue will directly impact all of the diff these different areas in all the facilities at the main department of corrections. I've also provided for you the, um, the uh, contracts that you requested. Our contracts are through legacy for the phone system and for the tablets. So that one you'll see is, is ours, legacy. Again, tablets and phones for the main department of corrections and yeah. Keith, Keith does our commissary. And so um, when we talk about Securus, that's the majority of the counties. And we're working, they're working very closely with Securus um, to provide that contract for you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, one, one question, did you, uh, just about the document and I have other folks who have questions. Is there a place in there that shows us what the balance is in the inmate betterment fund? Yes, yeah, so you should have that document, not in this particular document, but uh, that was sent over to you, I think, early morning. And it indicates that the Balda Correctional Facility has 182,000, Main Correctional Center has 232,000, the Main State Prison has 389,000, Long Creek has 34,000, uh, Mountain View has 392,000. And that's for a total for the main department of corrections of 1.2 million. And again, we have 1.2 balance as of today. Last year, we spent 908,000 um, for the care of the residents. Thank you for that. I now see that document. I appreciate okay. that. Um, uh, Senator DeChambeau. Thank you, Representative Warren. Um, I was taking notes and I didn't hear it, but I didn't write it down. I, I did understand that, um, I'm, I'm surprised it was that large, 239 jobs are paid for by the IBF. And That's correct. Someone else might have a question of what that means. Uh, but um, so that's money that they have it's like a salary it's it's a pay it's right. in your account they can buy you know canteen stuff or, or use it whatever is that also paying for um court ordered child support they can pay for that out of that and so any of the restitution court fines fees um uh, court ordered uh, child support all of that money can be taken out of out of those funds correct um do you have something that requires that they, it has a lot to do with money management, the fact that they would have to save money for upon their release. In the past, it's been that they spent all their money and taxpayers ended up having to transition them in the community. Um, so are they keeping a balance of, in anticipation of their release? Is that something? If, if, yes, Senator, thank you. If my memory um, serves me, um, we set aside 10% of their wages until they reach $1,000. And once they've reached that $1,000, there's no longer a 10% um, um, reduction. And so they have that money when they, walk, when they leave the facility for safe transition. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Senator. Next, I have Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, just uh, so if we decided to say we're going to pay for the telephone funds, um, that takes away from the IBF, correct? In that way, it really causes uh, a snowball effect of causing other issues. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, my perspective is if there's a reduction in, in uh, our ability, whether it be general fund or through the, the phone and, and commissary earnings, it'd be a significant impact to the quality of life for the residents. They really, um, uh, it makes a significant difference in the time that they do if they can have 
cable and and um, recreational equipment and postage if they don't have it, indigent phone services if they don't have it, um, you know, indigent commissary sales, those come from uh, this fund also, where if they don't have any money, we give them um, hygiene materials and, and phone calls and, and postage so that uh, they do have the ability to um, participate in that. Um, you know, education, library, all of those things coming out of the IBF. And so to answer your question, if any reduction in this, whatever the, whatever the source of funding may be, will impact the quality of life for the residents in our care. Next, I have Representative Morales, and then Representative Costain and Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, Commissioner. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering a couple of things, but I believe we talked a lot about this last session. And so I'm just wondering from Jane, there are documents that we probably have on bills regarding um, sort of percentages taken out of inmates who earn um, pay. And I think we had a, you, the commissioner provided a bunch of information to us. I'm just wondering if we can unearth those rather than reinvent the wheel and have you do it again. Cause I'd like to take a look at that again. And I do not recall what bill that was on. Um, so my question is around the inmate benefit fund. Um, Cause as I hear you talk about it, I had no idea it pays for reentry services such as housing. That's really, for me, problematic that we're having the inmates pay for their own reentry in housing um, in that way. Um, it pays for programmatic things that are necessary. It pays for hygiene materials. I feel like that's a moral duty on the part of the department and the, the state that we should be including that. Um, in our funding of the Department of Corrections and not taking that from, you know, the way that the inmates are able to connect with their family and friends in the community. I just have a real, like I'm having a visceral reaction to that. Um, and then the second piece of it is I wonder, um, there is this fund, uh, it is used for good things. Who, how does the process for decision-making work for how that funding gets used. And since it is for the benefit of the inmates, do the residents themselves have a say um, in what this could be used for and how it could in fact benefit them? Thanks. Thank, thank you, Representative. Um, so the uh, the fund is uh, uh, managed locally and, and monitored and audited by DAFs to ensure fidelity and, and proper expenditures. And so that's how it's monitored. And um, the residents are aware of where the monies go um, they don't have a, a direct influence of where it goes, but they're, they are aware of where it goes. And um, these are uh, very traditional expenditures that have been happening for decades. And so um, we do not ask them per se, um, but they are a part of, of um, they are aware of where the monies go and they are directly benefit from that. Can I have a follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, just <clears throat> on the, just kind of, uh, expounding on the managed locally. Um, I just, could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, and then uh, you and I have talked a lot about housing. And um, as far as I understood it, there was no reentry funding for housing, at least in many of my questions over the past couple of years. So this is a very su new surprising and not a bad surprising thing, but um, it's a surprising response. Um, presentation around that $64,000, um, which I don't have the document for. I'm not sure if there was a document you were reading off of, but $64,000 of the IBF has gone to assist folks with housing reentry. Am I right that that's what you said? And, and when did that start? And maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's correct. And so um, it's managed locally because uh, the wardens uh, work with the caseworkers and determine what exactly the needs of the reentering uh, individual may be. Um, we do have an individual right now that um, has um, has released and uh, is unable to find housing and has been put up in a, in a hotel for a while. Um, and so the caseworkers work very closely with the wardens to determine just exactly what the local needs are. I can get a breakdown for you, if you wish, of examples of where exactly that money has gone for housing um, over the last couple of years uh, by facility, and I'll, I'll get that to you. But yes, it is a document. You should have had this. We push this over to you 
yesterday afternoon, I think. So you have the this document I'm reading from. Okay, thank you. Next, I have Representative Pickett. I think Representative Costain was ahead of me. Oh, his he put his hand down. Representative yeah, Costain. Yeah, sorry about that. I had to switch. Uh, I had to switch from my phone to my iPad because oh, that's I'm okay. Dead. So I lost my hand, I guess. Oh, well, uh, go ahead, Representative. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, nice to see you this afternoon. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the $3.40 fee, uh, my understanding was that every time somebody puts money into an account, that fee is, uh, is assessed. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not certain of that, but I can find that for you if you wish. I believe that's what you told us the other day. So uh, may I follow up? Yes, please. Okay, so I give the example this morning in our caucus. So if you, if you have a, uh, somebody that's incarcerated and you're a working folk and don't have a lot of money, so you scrape up $5 today, okay, so that you could talk to your loved one in, in, the, in the jail, uh, you have to pay $5 and $3.40. $3 so my issue is, is if, if they... If people are, and I, I would assume they are, trying to uh, send money when they can to their, their loved one that's in the jail, uh, and they may get whacked three, four, five times a week. I mean, if, if they, you know, today they have three dollars because they turn some bottles in, for an example, so they give that to their to their child or whoever that's there. And, and they're, they're getting whacked at $3 and 40 cents. So it might be five times a week that they not only trying to put money in that account, but they're also getting that fee. Uh, I, I didn't know if, if, if that's a, a fact or if, if it's a one-time fee a week or, or whatever. For uh, a couple of contracts. So Securus is working with um, the, the counties and we work with legacy. And again, they provide not only, um, um, phones, but also texting, and, and that's been a very uh, popular way to communicate with uh, with uh, the family members. Um, but I would say this: in our in our circumstances at the Maine Department of Corrections, when people don't have those resources and they're indigent, we provide uh, you know free phone calls for them. Follow up. Uh, yes, please. So, and and I guess how how many calls would they get a week, or how how often would they get to to talk to somebody, I mean, they get they get uh, two phone calls a month. That for free calls, you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next up, we have Representative Pluker. Excuse me, we have Representative Pickett, and then Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think I may be wrong, but I think we're drifting a little bit away from what this bill is because we're talking about the bill. The bill is talking about uh, telephone, video and commissionary services and contracts. And uh, we're getting into a lot of other things that build up what what the account is that the uh, uh, the residents have. And I understand that. But getting back to what the bill really talks about, what my concern is with the uh, with the issues that the bill brings up. I uh, I read here and I and I see that this in your in your testimony, sir, you said about how uh, the fee for the DOC you get I believe it is uh, fourteen cents a minute for your calls and five cents per minute commission on each uh, uh, is uh, five cents per minute of each phone call is put in toward this uh, fund they have if I. If I'm correct, and nine cents per minute is charged for the for the call. Is that correct? Uh, Representative, that's correct. It's 14 minutes for the call, and five cents goes to the inmate benefit fund. Okay, and then 19 percent commission on most commissary on commissary purchases. Correct. Correct, and the pricing on the commissary is based upon a convenience store pricing. Okay. Okay. So. So the, the bill, the bill itself uh, talks about 
um, the fact of different fees. It talks about a connection fee. And uh, so I guess what I would like to know on the connection fee is, uh, it says a contract for services may not include a connection fee. So what are the, for, the, for what you provide in the DOC, what are there for connection fees that you charge? I do not know. I'd, I'd have to reference the uh, the contract to verify that. I'll get that back, the information back to you. And a clarifying a clarifying point I would like to make is that when individuals um, back to Representative Costine's question, when represent when individuals <clears throat> put money on an account electronically, there's a fee. If they mail the money in, there's no fee to um, add that to their account. Okay. So the in that in that respect, then it's kind of like uh, using your using your Visa card or your or your or your correct. credit card or whatever, stuff like that, getting assessed a fee for that, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. And so the other part of this, and I know it was a concern for you, uh, you were talking about uh, the fact that the two 15-minute uh, uh, phone calls per week, uh, um, and, I, and I understand your concern because what you were saying was that uh, if – something were to happen and and uh a disallowing disallowing a, a person to or wanting to not be able to allow a person to have a phone because maybe of something that's taken place a disciplinary action or something you were concerned about if the in law it said two 15 minute phone calls then that would mean that you'd have to give those two minute two minute two 15 minute phone calls regardless of that is that correct correct that is yeah. Okay, and I and I share that concern as well. I think there comes a responsibility with the be given the opportunity to have those fifteen minute calls. I think that if the if the residents know that uh, you know that they're going to be able to have those calls, they, they're, they're accountable for uh, for their actions and stuff to make sure they're they're allowed those calls. So I guess getting back to the whole the whole scheme of things and what the bill is trying to do, my goal would be for this bill to get rid of any of the, the three dollar and some odd cent fee that's uh, that's given that's given when people are trying to get money put money in their in their account for phones uh, those kind of fees connection fees if they are being charged if you are being charged if the connection fee is being charged or taken out of the uh, the the resident is having to pay those and also giving them the right for I believe there's been a good uh, re reference to a good uh, possible amendment to this, and that's free laws, free calls to their lawyers. I think that's important. I think that's something that they're, they are, they should be allowed to do. Uh, and uh, so I think that's, that's part of it too, but taking into consideration the fact of the, of the disciplinary, uh, the dis disciplinary issue that might come about that might cause the, lo the loss of the, being able to have those two phone calls. I don't know how we put that all together, but those are my concerns with the bill. I want to, I want the, I want the residents to get the best, the, the best treatment that we can possibly give them, give them the things they deserve to have. But I also want them to make sure that they understand that it is, it is a benefit and it's something that they have to be accountable for their actions as, as well. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, please. Um, in response to Representative Pickett, um, the the um, you know some of the fees that are charged or the or the nine cents is the cost of operating that system. Um, in two thousand five, that system um, you know there there there's an expense to all of the phones, all of the equipment, all the recording, all of the software. All of that comes from the industry. You know whoever you contract with. So there are expenses associated with that. And so to eliminate that would eliminate the company and um, I've run some numbers and, and, and I'll get this to you, but in 2005, um, you know, the information to me is about $3.8 million for that equipment and all of our facilities to maintain it, software, all of that. If we were to walk away from a contract totally and we did that ourselves, we would have to purchase the phone equipment, software, the, um, the uh, full-time equivalent positions to manage the, the monies that are done electronically now, those are the sorts of, of challenges that we have. If we were to, I don't know if we'd re renegotiate that contract or work with the, the, the companies, in my case, it's legacy. And um, uh, that, would be, that would be a challenge. I'm not sure how we would do that without new, 
new monies to manage that. And if I may, may Madam Chair? Yes, please. And uh, and I and I certainly I certainly appreciate that and stuff. I I just think that this is this bill, and I think it's take it's it's showing itself right now that it's not a simple fix. It's something that needs to be done, but we've got to find a way to be able to do it. But there's a lot of diff different moving parts here, and and you're right, the contract issue that that is a that is a part of it, but. Uh, We've got to come up with some kind of a solution here, and 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 make sure that the uh, the residents are getting what they what they deserve. But at the same time, that uh, we are as a state providing what we what we should provide in the best possible means we can. But there may be some charges that we may not be able to not be able to avoid. So somehow along the way, that's got to come into focus and come into play in order for in order for us, I think, to get a, to get really on board with this bill. Thank you. Next up, I have Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, once again, just going back to the, how the Inmate Benefit Fund is, is managed, uh, Commissioner Liberty, um, you, you said that the, these, these costs have just traditionally come out of the IBF fund for, for a decade or decades. And is, do, do you ever see some of these costs coming from other places and then moving back into the IBF or things moving out of the IBF or do things move back and forth from being funded in this way? Thank you, Representative. I haven't seen that. I have not seen like a, a um, because there's a budget reduction in some area and they, they compensate for it. I haven't seen any of that. Um, I have seen expansion and contractions of the levels of expenditure due to uh, an initiative, let's say. Let's say we want to expand something for them that, uh, let's say that we renegotiate the uh, cable um, company uh, with the cable company. We just did that uh, a year and a half ago, I think, expanding some more, um, you know, a broader range of interests. And, uh, the, and we went from analog to digital and it's greatly enhanced. It might cost more money to do that, so that expenditure may expand which the residents were very pleased with. And they were part of, and when I, I guess, I, guess I, um, I am aware of when they were included in some of this expenditures because we went through uh, quite a process of identifying what channels they would like, you know, how that should be broken down um, ethnically and, and you know, different interests. And uh, we, they have over a hundred uh, channels that they, that they watch uh, in, in the system and it meets all of their needs. And, and so they were part of that expenditure. That's one example of, that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you for that. And a follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, please. So looking at those 239 jobs that are funded out of this fund, how would you choose how what distinguishes those jobs that are funded out of this versus funded out of another source? Um, good question. So um, as an example, um, we have a, a standalone industry program that all of you are aware of and they do woodworking. Uh, that's a self sustaining sort of an operation and uh, the sales of those products pay for those jobs directly. Um, something that would be um, that would be more likely to be paid out of the IBF is something that that uh, benefits directly the the inmate population, the residences, like a peer tutor or maybe a um, uh, substance use uh, peer facilitator. Those sorts of works um, that might give them an opportunity to earn money doing substance use disorder programming, education, something like that. How about like cleaning or something like that to help maintain the facility? I wouldn't believe so. No. That'd be more of a facility operated. Thank you. Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Liberty. I'm looking at the contract with Legacy. Maybe I'm just reading this wrong. I think, you know, but, but what it says here, it's like a $1.4 million annually contract. And it says that Legacy or, or that DOC is, is, Paying legacy at nine cents for a, per minute for a call, twenty cents for an international rate, five cents for a commission rate, um, and then video is twenty five cents a minute, and with a five cent commission rate on top of that. So, what a and then earlier uh, to another representative's question, you were saying that there's a three point eight million dollar charge that legacy is putting on top of that to maintain the system what accounts for that discrepancy between 1.4 million dollars in the contract and 3.8 million uh, wh where are those charges coming from 
Thank you, Representative. That was just the cost that they assumed when the company, it was GTI at the time, when they, when they started from scratch and they had to implement all the phone systems back in 2005, that's what it cost to do that system. So there's, that's no cost to us. Um, when you see the, uh, the, the five cents, that commission, that term, I think you said, that's what comes to us. The nine cents goes to the vendor to maintain that system and pay for the equipment. That makes sense. Thanks. And can I have a follow up? Yes. Sure. Thanks. Um, so if the nine cents is just going to legacy, how is it, you know, what accounts, where in the contract does it say that legacy can charge another two bucks a minute or however much it is to maintain if we're already paying that nine, nine cents a minute or if the DOC is already paying them nine cents a minute, how is it that these charges where is that extra charge coming from and why, you know, why is DOC footing that bill and why is that not in the contract? If that's like, you know, where are these excessive charges coming from? I've, I've been informed that, uh, that there is no connection fee. There's no connection fee when someone gets on the, on the phone. I'll verify that for you, but that's the information I have right now. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Commissioner, I have a couple of questions and then I'm going to circle back to folks who already had an opportunity um, to ask questions. I'm trying to figure out, is your position today that you're opposed to the proposal or do you have sort of a counter offer or some way to lessen these charges and get a little closer to what the bill is asking for? So I just want to make the, um, the, the um, committee aware of possible unintended consequences of any modification of this. My main concern with any of this is only that we provide um, the same level of, of uh, resources and standard of living for the residents. That's my only concern here. I only want to make sense whether that is general fund money or however that works. But I, I am, am certain that um, the quality of life that's provided by these funds, the $908,000 that we spent last year, um, makes a significant difference in their success while they're doing time. If, I, if we were not able to pay the $138,000 for cable and they sat in their room um, without that, it would be just like us sitting at home when the power goes out. <laughs> you know, it's those are the things, right? We can all feel that pain for an hour. It's a big deal for us. But you can imagine sitting in a, in a cell working all day. And, and I also think it's very important that we're providing those, those opportunities where they can coach, mentor, be peer mentors, have those paying jobs where they can pay down their restitutions, their fines. That's my primary concern that they don't have any loss of this. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. I share that concern for sure. And I'm wondering, maybe the way that we get there, you know, is sort of looking, starting at the position of looking at what the inmate betterment fund is currently being spent on. And I think Representative Morales brought up, brought up housing as an example. And I'm looking at like chapel costs or, um, you know, pay for residents or transportation, you know, some other th issues that when I think of, you know, what a programming might provide, you know, do they, are those things that main families when they have an incarcerated loved one should be supporting or are they things that the department should be supporting? And maybe the way that we make a decision about these charges are making decisions around what should be supported by the these funds, if that makes sense to you. And so, you know, I'm just wondering if instead of us trying to create it, if there was any appetite on your part to bring us back a proposal whereby you, you know, sort of agreed, yeah, this is, pretty expensive for folks to be using the phones. And we'd like to change those rates that we're charging um, by this, 
particular amount and these are the things that are previously supported by the inmate betterment fund that we would move to pay for out of different funds within our department. Um, does that seem like a reasonable request as sort of a way to get us closer to a solution? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be glad to bring my team together and, and take a look at that and, and bring some residents in also and let their voice be heard, um, you know, what, the, what, what they think. I'd also, if I may, Madam Chair, um, clarify, um, I misspoke. Uh, the client pays nine cents a minute and um, the, the, the IBF gets five cents of that and, the, and legacy gets four. So it's a total of nine cents, just to clarify that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And you bring up an important point also that, you know, I want us to also remember the testimony of all the folks who are, you know, who are paying these fees. Sorry about that. Uh, next up, we have Representative Costain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I sit here and think about this and not that I'm not in support of a lot of things this fund is taking care of, but I, I'm looking at the taxpayers, okay, in the state that they have a loved one that's incarcerated and they're paying $900,000 a year, okay, because their loved one's incarcerated to to fund some of these things that I think that the state should be funding or to come out of your budget. Uh, I, I can't see that we can't take a look at this and try to lower the rates. And even if it has to go back to the budget, if you feel those things are that important, then we need to look elsewhere for it and not put it on the taxpayers that are already paying taxes to run the facilities as it is. So, uh, I guess it's more of a comment. What's your thoughts? Uh, Thank you, Representative. I, I, I currently have no budget to support this. You know, so that's what I'm saying. I don't have, there's no budget to support these items. And so um, my main concern is that um, if we were to make adjustments and there was no, no way to fund these, the resident ends up you know, taking the hit. I don't, I don't want this. Everything we do here is important. And um, it's important for them to be able to participate and be engaged and have paying jobs and have, have uh, some level of normalcy. And that's what we're all trying to do in, in corrections today, uh, normalizing uh, their environment. And uh, everything here is, is in support of that. And so that's my challenge, Representative, is that I currently have no budget to backfill for these, these items. And, and I'm concerned, um, I, I would be concerned as the um, political funding becomes available and emphasis, right, as the pendulum swims, swings back and forth. And, you know, some, some uh, committees may be favorable in, in spending and, and endorsing um, legislation to pay for some of these, and others may not. And this has sort of been political proof. You know, it's always been there for them, regardless of recession or lucrative uh, economic times, this money has always been there for them and they've had not a reduction in these services and access to these programs. So that's my only concern. Follow up, Chair? Yes. So do, do you get complaints from the parents or the loved ones that are funding this all the time about how much money they're funding uh, for these, these things that uh, are going on in the facility? Thank you, Representative. My, I'll, I'll, my, the, in my career, the majority of the complaints were as sheriff, when somebody comes new into the system and the family members are frustrated with, how do I get money on his books? It's over the weekend, it's gonna take 24 hours to, to, I can't figure out the system, it won't take my card. So early in the system, and I found this to be in the, in the counties because they're newly arrested and the system is foreign to them, it takes a little while to settle in and figure that out. One of the things that has really been a, a significant boost in the communication for our residents and their families is the texting that's been available uh, through um, Legacy. It's been fantastic. And I think that uh, Representative Luckner had it in front of him, but there's a schedule there. I think for, for I think it's $10, you can have 250 texts a month. So it's real time, and so they have their they have their uh, tablet in their in their um, um, cell, 
And um, as their children go off to school, they text their kids real time and say, just like we do, I hope you have a good day. Love you. And the, and the daughter and sons text them back immediately. It gives them that immediate connection. And the texting has been invaluable. And I think for $25, they can do uh, 500 texts, I think it is. And so that real-time texting has been really special, I think. And, and uh, um, it's been in play for, what, a year and a half, two years now. And it's been a nice leap forward, a nice and expensive way to communicate real-time. And um, so anyways, to answer your question, um, usually when they're new into the system, they're trying to navigate, figure that out. That's when it's been a challenge. Thank you. Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this question is for uh, Sheriff King. I see he's on. Uh, he's online here, and uh, you've been hearing the conversation we've been having with the commissioner, Sheriff. And uh, I've been looking over your testimony again from the other day, and. Uh, one sentence in particular says the cost of a telephone call varies from jail to jail. And from a recent unofficial survey, we find that only found that only two jails have a connection fee of a buck 30 per call. That dollar 30 per call on those jails that have that and that connection fee, how does that work? When is that a one time fee or is that every time the phone is used? How does that work? First of all, thank you very much for the question. And um, if I may, I apologize for not, when I looked at the notes that uh, Ms. Oberton put out, I, I didn't realize that you just wanted your county information. So what I, I've been working with the MSA to try to get the information from all of the jails, figuring I was just one of 15 jails. So I, I didn't quite bring it over the finish line to have all that, but I, I do hope that I can have a little bit more time to get you a definitive uh, answer. Also, um, it, it is, um, you mentioned earlier, Representative Pickett, that uh, this is not a one size fits all, and, and it really isn't. It's, it's um, there's so many variables to these, uh, to these charges. You know, it's the time of day, where it's placed, where it's going. And it's my understanding that the FCC a couple of years ago put a cap on some of the uh, on some of the charges. So that's why there's there's different rates, interstate, out of state, what's considered long distance and what's not. So um, I'm I'm finding it very, very confusing. And every um, facility has its own contract. To get back to where your question is, it's my understanding that the dollar thirty is a connection fee. So as soon as you pick up the phone and I call and the person on the other end says, okay, this is a call from the York County Jail. Will you accept charges? Yes, I will. That dollar thirty is charged. That's my understanding of a connection fee. Um, and yes, every time that individual, the resident makes a telephone call, that same caveat is used, the recording is used, and when they pick, when they accept it, the dollar thirty is charged, um, the connection fee. I'm not certain if that includes the first minute. Now, in, in at the York County Jail, our first minute is a dollar thirty-seven, but it's a full minute, um, and then it after that it varies between five and fourteen cents. Um, but you know, when you mentioned that. Uh, that it's not a one size fits all. You're, you're absolutely right. That this is, I, I find it, I mean, I can somewhat understand your county's pay structure, but I, um, I, I don't understand a lot of the other ones. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, then if uh, somebody were to call that connection is made, it's a dollar 30 on the person that's receiving the call. Dollar and thirty dollar charge, a dollar and thirty cent charge to their to their phone bill, and then for the first minute, there's another. I think you said what dollar uh, and forty some odd cents or something like that for the first minute. Oh. So a person before having one minute of call is already up to two dollars and fifty cents for that call. So yeah. that two dollars and fifty cents to some people. Uh, would make it very difficult, I would think, to have a, a 
a whole lot of calls made throughout the throughout the month or to even try to call uh, if some kind of a situation comes up. I mean, that's if something comes up and, and somebody from the family really needs to uh, get a hold of get a hold of the uh, of the resident or the resident needs to get a hold of them. I mean, I could see where that could really build uh, quickly. And my problem with that is I don't mind them having to pay for their for their time on the phone, but I just have the the cost that like connection calls, connection fees, and stuff that I know you don't have any control over. I understand that, but those are the issues that really bother me about this. Yeah. Is the those fees there, and I really don't know what the answer is. Like you, what the answer is to try to yeah. see that go away. Go ahead. I know you to respond. Yeah, yeah. May I? I, I perhaps I wasn't clear, and I apologize. Um, what, what it's my understanding that the connection fee for those other facilities, I said that as soon as they pick up and they accept it, a dollar thirty kicks in. I'm not certain if that includes the first minute. I can only assume that it does. Now in York County, our first minute is a dollar thirty seven. So our, you know, and that's it's, it, that doesn't mean that we have a dollar thirty connection fee and a dollar thirty seven. But in York County, our first minute is a dollar thirty seven, and then it's five to fourteen cents, and any every additional minute. But the, but the fee structure is quite, um, you know, there, there's it's it's very confusing. And I, if you can see it, this is my fee structure that I wanted to break down and make it more readable prior to giving you. Um, um, sending you the, these documents. And I want to do it for every jail. And I, I still hope that I'll have an opportunity to do that, try to make it more readable. And Securus Technology is actually, uh, we've been chatting with them um, and um, they may even be monitoring it. But um, that uh, I, I, I told them that we needed to um, get some information down. And I believe they sent a, um, uh, through the main sheriffs, they, they sent a PowerPoint for your, uh, for your perusal. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Jane, did we get that PowerPoint? Yes, I just it just came in and I forwarded it to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheriff, for that. Senator DeChambeau. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Um, I know I, I'm still a legislator and I still have to make decisions. Uh, listening to the commissioner, I'm sitting here thinking, um, and I bear with me, I do have a question at the end, but um, <clears throat> having been involved with this and somewhat the recipient in that as case workers, you needed a discretionary slush fund that you could use very minimally. Um, I want to go back to what Representative Castain suggested or asked the question rhetorically, I guess, that <clears throat> the parents of people who are incarcerated about footing that um, bill, that costs uh, as taxpayers, uh, let me just tell you, in my 40 plus year career, this has been tried and tried again with different bills trying to um, minimize the, um, the expense of someone who's incarcerated for, by the family, I should say. It always gets front page news with families who are taxpayers who don't have people incarcerated and saying, we don't have a TV, we don't have a computer, and what have you. What the, what, what the legislature cannot seem to do is to bite the bullet and say, that is the cost of running a prison. I want to tell you about the days when I first started. It was in a statute that the only thing we had to give an inmate is a suit and $50. And the Greyhound bus stopped at Thomaston to pick them up to bring them to Portland. 
it stopped right at the prison, can you imagine, and getting on the bus, and that was it. There were no payoffs, as I, I don't know what the right word is. Um, there was no computers, no TVs. Um, there was very little money of slush funds. We don't even have a very good statute on how to handle not only the basketball and the food and the cookies and what have you, but as someone dies and dies in prison with no family, that money is used to bury them. The state does not bury them. I've used that money to transport a prisoner from Wyndham to up Prescott area because his family couldn't pick him up but they had the plot of land. Those are the things that aren't covered and those are the examples that are used. We're managing people. Um, and I know it's hard to accept or to see, but I'm sitting here thinking, if we didn't have that, what would we have? And I, it's refreshing to hear a commissioner speak prisoner and that is true the, you know not to have the computer not to have the tablet not being able to call home and as far as calling lawyers three times they've had to use my phone because lawyers will not accept the collect call will not accept even a call that the inmate pays for but they will accept it from me or from any caseworker these are the day-to-day -day struggles of managing a population. Uh, if we can find a way, and I appreciate your suggestion, Representative Warren, but we have an obligation in legislature to, to see what it is we should be paying and could. When you talk about hygiene, there are prisoners, they get soap, but there are things that they need even to shave or what have you, we find a way to get that product, but it doesn't come out of a state budget. So I, um, my question and what, very simply, as I was sitting here, I was wondering, what does New Hampshire and Vermont do? I'd like to compare myself to New Hampshire and Vermont and not California, but um, I don't even know how they do it. Ours is very homegrown. I, I feel personally involved when we use inmate funds to help them because it's a case by case basis. So, but that's my question. That's my request um, is I'd like to know what other states do. Um, did you want Jane to get that information? Oh, Senator, you're muted. Yes, I was looking at Jane, but I don't know maybe if the commissioner has that information or could get it from his counterpart. That would be simpler too. Madam Chair, I think Sheriff King may have some information for us. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. Sheriff King, do you want to share the information that you have to answer Senator DeChambeau's question? I, I would. Thank you very much, Representative Warren. Um, I don't have the specific answer, but I believe someone from Securus is, is monitoring if you want to invite them in. And I believe that they also have many of the facilities in New Hampshire. And, and it was my understanding that there was a, uh, a similar bill in New Hampshire that that they just um, um, that was just discussed, and and they may be able to shed some light, but I I don't have any of the specific information. Uh, I would like just to clarify my last statements though. That dollar thirty seven first minute was for a collect call. That was for a collect call. If somebody has money in their account, uh, the first minute is twenty one cents, and every minute afterwards twenty one cents for a um, local call. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. I don't see that there's anyone that's unknown in the attendee list. It looks like we know all of those 
folks. So I'm not sure that we have somebody from Securus here. Um, up next, I have Representative Morales and then Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I make a motion ought to pass. I'll second. Discussion on the motion. I have Representative Costain next. Oh, Senator Searway, I'm sorry. Why is your, you still had your hand up, right? You're next. Um, you're on mute, sir. There you go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I guess, is this discussion now afterwards? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I, I mirror what uh, Senator DeChambeau said. Um, I, I see this as a, as there, there are needs, always going to be needs. I see where I think the Sheriff's uh, Association and uh, the, the, the Department of Corrections have done a wonderful job is trying to do their best in these circumstances. And I know while I worked at the Sheriff's Office as a, a Lieutenant Assistant Jail Administrator, there's always these challenges and you always try to do the best for the inmates, for the people that uh, call you and complain or whatever. Uh, and they come up with the best solutions that they can. I will say that um, I have some friends that have some uh, prisoners that have friends that are their Their relatives are at state prison and whatever. And uh, one of them got, has a job uh, teaching keyboard to the, kid, to the others. Uh, I know there's, uh, and he gets paid for it. It's a nice benefit. And so, uh, and it's from, from the benefit fund. And so those things have wonderful, uh, and he's in there for a long time. And, and so it's, it's a real benefit for him. And he's never complained about the phone or the texting and the family hasn't, they've always had good contact. So I'm saying to me, uh, why are we, uh, you know, and, and also there is a, a chance to develop a little funds for them for later when they get out and whatever. So I, I don't think it should be left up to the taxpayers to pay for all the, the, uh, the, the like the, the, the cable TV and stuff like that, that, and all these channels when I, I mean, I've got just the antenna myself, it, it's a choice, but um, it's just, I'm just saying that I think they've done a good job and I just don't want to change it unless we really had something substance that really could change it uh, in a positive way from the commissioners and from the sheriff's association saying we can do this. This is the amount that we think we could do it with and they could put it in the budget instead of us just making up something and coming up with uh, you know, a, uh, well, I, I'd say it's kind of like just uh, shooting from the hip. Um, and that's what I think this bill is doing. I, so I'm gonna say I ought not to pass on this. I have, thank you, Senator Searway. I had Representative Costain next. I'm gonna defer for a minute, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, Representative Pickett next. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. If, uh, if at this point here, uh, if the, the person who made the motion and who seconded it, if we, after my request, we're willing to uh, resend those motions for right now, I have the bill sponsor, uh, Representative Kenny, who has a, an amendment that she wanted to make to the bill. She's been here from the very beginning of it. And uh, and I'd like to have her have an opportunity to speak and speak to that amendment because it might make a difference in what we do on the bill. So I would I would ask ask if that would be possible if the people involved in the motion would be willing to resent that for the time being until we hear from her. Thank you. Absolutely, Representative Pickett. Thank you. I'll withdraw you. my I'll withdraw my second then since Representative Morales withdrew her motion. Yes, please, Representative Kinney. 
Uh, thank you, Representative Warren. Um, I I don't know if I have a specific amendment in in mind. Um, I have spoken with the people that have asked me to bring this forward. They one concern they had was to have uh, the emergency preamble stripped, which can also be done on the floor of the house at a later time, um, possibly if we needed to uh, to pass something, but. Um, listening to a lot of the discussion around this, um, I personally had no idea where some of this money was going and what it was doing for, for inmates. And having in Waldo County, we have the reentry program in our, in our jail. We don't have a county jail anymore. And seeing the people as they're coming back into society, having to, having some sort of a fund to help them, uh, to be able to reintegrate into society is a wonderful thing, I think. And it shouldn't be on the backs of all taxpayers to pay for that. In some ways, that should be something that the inmates are earning. Um, you know, I, I can put a roof over my house because I hold a job. And um, I, I don't know. So I'm just, I am concerned. I'm, I'm listening to some of this. I don't, I don't know. I, my mom used to work for the phone company when I was a kid, and I remember we had to wait till after seven o'clock to make long distance calls because it was more expensive during the day. I don't see that as as much of an issue today as it used to be. Um, I guess I'm hoping that you all who have a lot more information at your fingertips can come up with a, an amendment that could be um, supportive of both the families who are trying to communicate with their loved ones that are incarcerated for whatever reason. Um, you know, they've, they've obviously broken the law in some way or way, shape or form. That's why they're an inmate in a prison, but it's not the children's fault. And to deny them the ability to be able to talk to their loved ones on a particular day or because there isn't enough money to put on that phone account is troubling. Um, and I was, I, and there was no amendment made, but I, I am concerned about the idea of the amendment with um, that was brought forward during the public hearing for the lawyers to have the free calls. I, they have the inmates definitely need to be able to speak with their lawyers. I, I have no um, qualms about that, but at the same time, I brought the bill forward to help the families, not to help the lawyers. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not. I don't know how to put that in, into place um, to, to help out um, with, I mean, here we are on Zoom, which we, I, I think most of us have free accounts for, for Zoom. So I don't know what kind of things there are available. If the tablets are available, is it possible to allow them a free Zoom account to be able to have a conversation? But again, there has to be that money to, to help fund those tablets to have the accessibility to a tablet. And again, as a, I have to mm -hmm. buy a tablet, Heck, I have to buy my own tablet to run my Zoom meeting for, for this event. So um, for, you know, to do my legislative work, I, I don't have anything given to me by the, the legislature. So I, I see both, I, I see both sides and I, and I'm, I, I want to try to do something, but I'm not sure the bill as written is the way to go. I don't know if that, cleared anything up but <laughs> i believe that was the absolute opposite of an amendment to <laughs> representative Kinney. <laughs> i'm just joking i am right there with you that uh this is you know there's this isn't an easy solution so thank you for your comments um representative morales uh, excuse me any questions for representative kinney you have a question for representative kinney senator DeChambeau. thank you Thank you. Um, and thank you. Uh, I will honestly call you Mary Ann, but Representative uh, Kinney, um, wherever this is going, um, I'm not to uh, totally against your bill. Uh, I think this was an education for all of us. Uh, and I would be willing to sit down with you and work with the commissioner or anyone or his designee to work on an amendment um, 
and, and find ways, but be very mindful of, quote, the big T, the taxpayer. Um, and um, so let's see if we can cut down that contract a few cents anyways or something or use tablets or Zoom or what have you. I'd be willing to help you out on that. Thank you, Senator. That was, I, it is, it, this is tough because I, I am, I'm very mindful of the taxpayers. And, you know, when I think about, I can think about my own family. I don't have anyone that's incarcerated. And I know that my tax dollars do go to help the jails out in some way, shape or form. But um, at the same time, I, I also felt for Courtney Allen's son who couldn't call his dad because they didn't have the extra money to put on the account one week. So I'd, I, I'd love to see us come up with something to help keep everybody happy. And I, I am concerned with some of, it sounds like the main correctional facilities have a slightly better contract that, than the um, county jails. And I'm wondering if that is something that could be worked out that to work a, a contract that, that helps all of them as a collective unit, maybe. I don't, I, I don't know if that's possible. Just trying to throw something out there. And that is part of something that you have in the bill, which is where the DOC would um, allow or require, the bill also requires the department to negotiate contracts for services, allowing county jails to opt in at the lowest cost to the client. Um, and I think that, as we all know, that, you know, sometimes when you can get a larger spread of the cost, the cost goes down. So that's definitely a part of the bill that I support. Um, I think there is some conversation about taxpayers. I want us to remember that those of us who have family that are incarcerated, we also pay taxes. So there isn't two different groups, the taxpayers and the family who have folks that are incarcerated. We're the same people. And so that's just important to remember. Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I just wanna thank the sponsor too for bringing this bill and for this discussion. Um, you know, I think when we think about the policy, you know, we're trying to figure out the details of implementing potentially a policy that I think we all believe is the right policy. And so I'm just wondering whether that's our role. Um, you know, I'm, we've had this discussion today, how it impacts uh, children of folks who are incarcerated. We know that connection with family on the outside improves recidivism, it reduces it gets people back on track quickly when they can continue that connection. I think that's sort of innate in all of us. We know that we don't need a study to show that, but there are studies that show that. So I think on the policy, we're, we're all there. Um, and I hear that maybe we, be, we may be able to get there um, all together. So before I, uh, I make uh, a motion um, of uh, uh, to pass as amended, because I think if I were going to make a motion, it would be to include the programming that we all believe really should be there. And we should be doing that anyways. And I know from what we've heard from Commissioner Liberty is we have 500 empty beds in our prisons and we have a budget of upwards of 200 million. And I believe that this kind of programming is very important for public safety. It's very important for reducing recidivism rate and it's something we should be supporting. So I'm gonna hold off on making a, a motion to see what other folks have to say, but I'm very, very interested in moving forward on this policy. But if folks think we can get there together, uh, I'd be really happy to do that as well. Thank you, Representative. Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question I have is for, actually for the commissioner, the bill sponsor, and also for Senator DeChambeau. And that is, do you, are you three think that if you have some time to work on this, that you can come up, come up with something that uh, we can all get our, get our arms around to pass this bill through, because it's necessary, we have to do something for these inmates to be able to have a, a, an opportunity to 
to reach out and call their homes and stuff. And But do you think it, because if not, if you don't think you can, then we're just going to have to fall on what side we are, are on right now. And uh, that'll be the way it is. But I really want this to succeed if you folks are willing to work together and try to see if you can come up with something. Thank you. So I guess I'll ask you one by one, Commissioner. Right now we can. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau. Well, I was gonna help the <laughs> sponsor, but yes, we need the commissioner. Um, yeah, if, if that's uh, acceptable for the sponsor. <clears throat> Representative Kinney. I'd be happy to, to sit down and try to come up with a, a solution that helps both the prison system and the families that are outside. I mean, there's there, I'd love to see something be able to be worked out that's a compromise for all involved. Thank you. And Sheriff King, I think that the, the sheriffs need to be involved or you may get stuck with something that you know, isn't one that is one size fits all, right? So I think getting to the table, and I think it's maybe it's going to, you know, depend upon percentages, right? What you can charge above what you're paying, or, you know, if you can charge anything above what you're paying. So, Sheriff King, are you willing to, you or someone else from the association, work with this astute group to come up with a amendment for us? I would be honored to. Thank you for including us. And um, you're absolutely right. Economy of scale may reduce some of the pricing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, next up, I have Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize for not uh, asking the good Sheriff from York County for being involved in that uh, discussion. But uh, with the answer to my question being what it was, I make a motion to table. I second. We have a motion on the floor to table made by Representative Pickett, seconded by Representative Morales and Deb will call the roll. Please and thank you. Absolutely. Um, cameras on and unmute, please, for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau. Yes. The motion passes with nine yes and four absent. Thank you, Deb. All right, so let's keep going. Senator DeChambeau, do you want me to keep going? Do you do you want to take over? Do you have a preference of what bills we take next? And you're on mute. Uh, thank you for asking, um, uh, Representative Warren. You know, I got to go and do something before my car is locked up for the weekend. So I got to go pick it up. Right. I forgot that. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, can we do my main criminal code? If, if, oh, come on. Is um, um, Mr. Pelletier here? He is, yes. Is that okay with all of you? It's okay and, with me that we deal with the clock bills. 536. Let's do it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm the sponsor, but uh, we're going to tag team Mr. Pelletier and I. I would 
venture guests. Um, I'm not going to go step by step, but uh, big kudos to Ms. Orbiton for her summary of a very long <laughs> um, and sometimes complicated um, bill before us from CLAC. Um, so we could do step by step uh, if Mr. P and unless where is Representative Warren? She stepped out. Um, is there a different way? Do, do you want to go questions or we've gone step by step on this one before? Um, yeah, I don't think we need to go step by step. Okay. Um, but it looks like Mr. Pelletier would like to kick us off. But Mr. Pelletier, you're not going to walk through the whole bill, right? No. <laughs> Sorry, I hope that didn't come across as rude because I did not intend it to. That's okay. Thank you, folks. Uh, I, I thought I'd start because with respect to this bill, at the last work session, there were two questions uh, for us that you wanted me to take back to the CLAC uh, board. And uh, I think there's an easy solution to one because what you asked for was clarity about section one of the bill and that had to deal with um, uh, concurrent or non-concurrent sentences for people who committed crimes at the prison or while on a stay. And if I recall correctly, that issue, what Clark's recommendation as to how to resolve that section one was adopted by the committee with respect to LD801 and that moved on. So that leads me to suggest that section one of this bill can come out uh, and that that issue is resolved elsewise, uh, elsewhere. And then you asked me about uh, part D, I, I, I called it section one, it, it is A1, it was part A. Now I'm gonna speak about part D. Part D was, uh, is the, um, what the, the uh, Representative Warren refers to as the Good Samaritan Law, which is a law that shields people from uh, pr uh, criminal prosecution if they call uh, with respect to an overdose, seeking assistance for themselves or someone else. And uh, I took that back to the committee because I had made a mistake and I had mischaracterized what it was, but uh, so uh, this is what it is, uh, what this it is. The bill provides, the current law provides some immunity with respect to four specific crimes. It also provides immunity from having your probation revoked if you're involved in one of these situations. But that revocation of the probation is not limited to behavior that violates those four specific crimes, but it's a complete shield against probation violations. So even if in responding, they came up with evidence that you had violated some other aspect of your probation or committed some other crime, they couldn't revoke your probation. What this provision that is before you does is it limits it uh, so that the protection against new criminal charges and the protection against probation violations are co-equal. Right now, the protection against probation violations is larger. So it limits the protection against probation violations to the conduct that would constitute uh, those, those four crimes. Now, when I went back to the CLAC group, this is what the result of our discussion was. The language in front of you is the correct language that was requested by the Department of Corrections and it accomplishes what the Department of Corrections asked us to do, which is to make the protection against probation violations the same as the protection against cr criminal prosecution. Hearing that, having that discussion, then there were people on our board who thought that's good. That's what the DOC asked us to do. The language does it correctly. We're in support of it. But there were others who said that the overall impact of this is to narrow 
the Good Samaritan law. It, it narrows it in the name of consistency, but it does narrow it somewhat. And there were members on our board who said, uh, we don't, given the epidemic of overdose deaths, we don't think this is the time to narrow the Good Samaritan law. So here we have a provision in a clock bill and we have, we do not have unanimous support on our group for this provision. Ordinarily, that would mean it's not in the clock bill because we would not bring something to you that couldn't get gain support from all of our members. But the bill is in front of you. And uh, so it's, it's up to you. Uh, the bill accomplishes, what's in the bill accomplishes what it was designed to do. It is the correct language and it is supported by approximately half of our group. But there are others who think now is not the time to narrow the Good Samaritan line. So that's my report back on part D. Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. Um, okay, let's hear next from the sponsor, Senator DeChambeau. Yeah. Um, Mr. Pelletier, I'm looking at, and frankly, I. I misplaced the bill, but I'm looking at um, uh, the um, policy, uh, uh, the analyst. Um, so D, okay, I got to set this straight. So you're, you're in an apartment, you're with another person, they overdose, I'm on probation, I call for the ambulance, my probation officer happens to be around the corner, he shows up. So somewhat good Samaritan, my probation officer is not going to revoke me. I mean, correct? Well, under the current law, the probation officer couldn't revoke you. If Part D were to pass, the probation officer couldn't revoke you because there's drugs and paraphernalia in the, in, in the apartment, and so you're in possession of drugs and paraphernalia. But if this were to pass, and the person who, who you, on whose behalf you called was someone that as part of your probation, you had a no contact provision with, the probation officer, if this passed, could revoke you for having had contact with that person for violating the no contact provision. If right, right now, in terms of new crimes, you can't be charged with the drugs possession and the paraphernalia. Uh, and what this does is it limits the protection against probation to the drugs and the paraphernalia. But if you violate some, if you're violating some other provision of probation, you could be violated if this passed. Okay, that's violation. The police show up, can that person be arrested now? The person can be arrested. Uh, let's say they were a felon and they had a firearm on them. They could be arrested for the crime of possession of a firearm by a felon. They could not be arrested for the crime of possession of drugs or possession of drug paraphernalia uh, or uh, acquiring drugs by deception. And I'm going to add one more layer. So the, pol the probation officer is there, um, may choose even, even if this pass, I, frankly, I doubt they'll violate for that but notices that there are items that they know was uh, obtained through a robbery or a burglary. Um, th so that's enough, they could be arrested if they were, if you saw evidence of another crime. If the, if the police or the probation officer saw evidence of another crime, not the four crimes listed in the current language, they could arrest you for that, yes. Okay, thank you. Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, under section four, uh, Mr. Pelletier, uh, it says in there that it says under current law, what can happen, but then it also says CLAC proposes to narrow the protection from protection from any probation violation to protection from a probation violation for possession of drugs. That's what that's what CLAC is proposing, correct? That's correct. 
So if the bill, if the bill were to pass as amended, with these, with all of these parts except section or part A, which is what you are removing. So it'd be part parts B, C, D, and E. Then that D would be just exactly like the like the proposed language that I just read. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I move ought to pass on the bill with uh, omitting part A of the bill and the rest as written and amended. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I need a clarification. I'll second it. Okay. Okay, we have a second. And Senator DeChambeau, what's your? Yes. Um, you said pod A, eliminate all that. Okay, yes, I'm sorry, my mistake. That because discretionary is in the other bill. Okay, thank you. Okay. Morales has amendment. Okay, Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, um, just as we discuss this motion and thinking really deeply about this really complex bill, I'm glad that part A is removed for us. And uh, so that makes it a little less complicated. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with part D uh, with narrowing the Good Samaritan law right now, uh, particularly with what we know about the op opioid and substance use crisis that we're experiencing in Maine. So I am not in favor of that. So if the, um, I, I'm in favor of the bill that we worked on last session, this Good Samaritan law has just been put into place. I really don't think it's time for us to amend that. Um, we don't have data to suggest that we need to amend it yet. Um, and we worked so hard on it. I, I don't know if you remember, but we had one version of the bill and then we came back and we amended it in session um, in committee, um, and then it got full support from our committee. I believe it was full so unanimous support. So this is a bill we worked really hard on. So I'm having a hard time thinking that we're going to amend that to change that now. Um, and then I have a creative suggestion, you guys. Mm -hmm. We were discussing on the last bill about a fund that helps inmates in many very significant ways that we all agree we wanna continue funding. Here we have in part B of this CLAC bill, LD 536, funding that we end up sending to the Maine State Treasury because we have no place for it to go. So I'm thinking that I would like that funding instead of being sent it's restitution funding. Instead of being sent back to the Maine State Treasury to go into the general fund, I would like to discuss with you and suggest that we put that funding into the resident benefit fund. And I'm wondering if the sponsor of the, or the uh, uh, Representative Pickett would be interested in, in those amendments to his motion. And so just to be clear before Representative Pickett responds, you, you support removing section A, you further support removing section D, and you'd like to amend section B so that those funds, that instead of going back to the treasury, go to the, the resident benefit fund. That's right. Okay, I would support that just as a side note. Representative Pickett, your thoughts on amending your motion? So if I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, it's uh, removing section A, and I think uh, it's wanted to remove section D altogether. And then this other suggestion on, on B, putting funds into, uh, into the uh, prisoner benefit fund, is, if I'm understanding that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, that being said, before I can make any decision, I would like to have a break out for about five minutes with my caucus. 
Sure. And it looks like Senator Searway has a question. Senator, did you want to ask that before you take a break with your group yes, or did you want to ask that now? Yes, I'd like to ask just before. Okay, great. Go for it. Um, so uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the John Pelletier. Um, on these funds for the treasurer for unclaimed property, how would that work as far as um, the legality of taking somebody's property that they just haven't claimed yet? I, 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 I really can't answer that. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because the person who had the money was the defendant who has a restitution obligation. They have paid the money to the Department of Corrections uh, to uh, satisfy that obligation. So they, they're, they're, they're obligate, they, they've satisfied their obligation. Corrections is holding the money for the victim. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I just, I, I can't express an opinion on it. Right now, it's ambiguous because it says the court will determine what happens with it. And the, the problem with that is that the court doesn't know what to do with the money either. <laughs> but my understanding, I think from the last discussion, is that if it goes into the unclaimed property fund, it goes there for a, a, a term, and then eventually, if it's not claimed, it goes to the general fund. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, th that's my understanding. I don't really know if it's, it's money that's been ordered, turned over to a victim. The victim has not sort of stuck around to, or stayed in touch to get it. So it's, uh, it, it's an ambiguous situation that I don't have an answer for. And I'll just read, that might be helpful, Senator Searway. This came from Ms. Black. Uh, currently the DOC does not hold funds when victims cannot be located. Rather, DOC follows Title 17A, Section 2009, which requires the restitution funds in these cases be turned over to the treasurer where they are treated as abandoned, unclaimed property. That's yeah, in your I up I analysis. Yeah, I get that, but sometimes the victims may have been moved. They could be in... Uh, you know, somewhere where they're not supposed to be found for a while for safety. There could be a lot of reasons why they haven't located them or gotten contact. And I just don't want to take the funds away from victims if we don't know how that affects them. So I'm just kind of concerned about that. Right, of course, thank you. Uh, Jane had something to add before we take a quick break. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I just wanted to clarify on the on, on the restitution piece. Um, there are two laws on unclaimed restitution. There is one law that applies to unclaimed restitution held by a prosecutor's office, and there is another that applies to unclaimed property restitution held by the Department of Corrections. This bill in part B um, attempts to line both of them up so that both of those money go to the treasurer. What we heard from the Department of Corrections is that they are already sending their unclaimed restitution money to the treasurer. But that is not in compliance with the law that applies to them. Okay, so it would be good to address that issue somehow because right now they are not applying to the court. They are sending it to the unclaimed property fund the same way the prosecutors are. Okay. Great, thank you. Yes, Senator DeChambeau. Just wanted to add, 
uh, and I can't find it now. Uh, Henry Beck sent us a long detailed email on that because um, there was a question posed to him the last time we discussed this is what efforts do they take to find um, the person? And it was all detailed in the email and I can't find it right now, uh, but I was, okay, uh, Jane's probably gonna help me on that it, one. It, it is in, I put all, all that material in the back of the bill analysis form. So oh, if- in back? Okay. Yeah, so if you go to your bill analysis form- There it is. It's all there. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Good. That's okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we'll take a break. I did send via email a link for um, folks who want to meet and talk about this bill. Could I make a comment before we break? Sure. Um, I'm just thinking about what I've heard from um, Tessa Mosier um, on the victim's um, advocate front and how they have staff devoted specifically to reaching out to victims, notifying them, um, you know, when they need to be notified of folks uh, returning to the community and, and so forth. Um, that, you know, the, my belief based on everything I've learned is that if the DOC cannot find a victim, when they have staff devoted to attending to victims' needs and connecting with victims, then once it gets to the treasury, there is not that connection anymore. Um, and so I think to Senator Searway's point, of course we don't ever wanna foreclose the opportunity um, for victims um, to be able to receive that funding. But if in fact, everything we've done um, is, it, it, you know, to the extent that the DOC puts forth that effort and it doesn't happen. I, I do not believe it's going to happen once it gets to the treasury. That doesn't have that specific victim focus. Thank you. Great, okay, so are we deciding five minutes or should we do 10 minutes, Representative Pickett? What are you thinking? Five would be fine. Five, okay, so that is gonna be 240.
I just, I don't know. Okay, we're back and we have a motion on the floor. Oh, remind me, you made a motion, Representative Pickett, and we asked if you would be willing to amend your motion. Okay, Representative Pickett. Yes, I thank you, Madam myself. Chair. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, could I just have, could, could Representative Morales just tell me one more time just what she wants to do with that in part B. Yes, um, it's really related to the discussion that we just had uh, mm -hmm. on the inmate benefit fund. Um, and that the unclaimed restitution that would go to the treasury to then go into the general fund if it's not claimed would instead go into the IBF. So instead of sending it to Treasury. Yeah. And that's what we thought, but I, I wasn't I wasn't sure. I wanted to be crystal clear on that first. That being said, uh, I have no problem uh, putting those putting those requirements of removing pot D from the bill and uh, and also adding the language in part B that we just spoke of. And Beautiful. I'll suck it I'll second that amendment. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, Senator Searway and then Representative Newman. Just a, a clarification. Um, so these funds on, on Part B go to the treasure for unclaimed properties for a certain amount of time, correct? Um, Representative Morales. Um, are you asking how it currently works? I think no, no, told, it, would, it, oh. it would, it would, if we do this, um, so the money, the funds from, for the victims fund would go to the, the treasurer for a period of time for the, uh, unclaimed property. And then once it met the time frame, then it goes to the general fund. That's when we can get those funds. Correct. Well, that's not how I think the statute reads currently. I think it reads that it stays with the department and that they do their work to contact the, the victims. Um, and then it goes to the treasury. So it won't then, ever get into unclaimed property then. Right. That sort well, of general. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go with that. I think it needs to have to go on unclaimed property first. So it gives them a chance if, if they're if they don't seem to be able to get a hold of because they may have moved or they may have uh, gone hiding or whatever, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of times victims uh, are not found for a while. Uh, so I just, I just don't want to, uh, for family's sake, for the kids, whatever. I just think that just taking the money from directly after the victim's advocates can't find them then, or DA's office or whatever. Because I've gotten many complaints of not getting their restitution or getting called by the DA's when the restitution finally got the amount or whatever, they didn't get the call. And whether they have phone number changed or whatever, they just didn't get the call. So I think it needs to go in unclaimed for a while anyway. Uh, so maybe, yeah, if it goes to a period of time, and then when it goes, gets decided to go to general fund, that might be the time when we could put that money to corrections. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Um, thank you, Senator Searway. I have Representative Pickett and then Senator DeChambeau. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. And that's what my understanding was, and maybe I misunderstood. I, I wanted, I wanted it to be that to require to requ to to require that the funds go into the 
treasurer in the unclaimed property if the DOC cannot cannot locate find who they belong to. Uh, and then after the amount of time that it stays in unclaimed property, I'm not sure what that time frame is, but where it stays there, because that gives a second chance for the person to maybe locate the money. And if they don't locate it, then at the time frame when the unclaimed money would be turned over to the general fund, instead of going to the general fund, I want that to directly go into the IBF fund. Okay, great. I would agree with that process as well. Um, Representative Morales, since you are the one who made the amendment to the amendment, do you agree with that as well? I do agree with that. Thank you for okay. the discussion and for the suggestion, Senator Searway. Great. Okay, so it sounds like we're all in agreement there. Senator DeChambeau. Oops, you're on mute. Yes, I was just want to read what, uh, in my head, I want to be clear that um, it's almost dedicated uh, funds, and I, I wanted to know. Uh, so this is what Henry Beck says. The question posed to him, assuming a change in the law, could the Office of Victim Services apply unclaimed restitution to use for children of incarcerated parents? He says, assuming a change in law to allow for this method of claiming, the treasurer as the administrator of unclaimed property fund will require a sufficient showing of ownership and relationship. So um, we would likely work with DOC to discuss specific forms and methods. So I guess it's worth taking a chance to put it in the law if it's quote against some rule, but it looks like if we did put it in the law, um, he would work with DOC. He would only require, you know, ownership, but they'll va validate who the who the guy is or the gal is. So for that reason, I'll support this. Okay, great. Thank you, Senator. So uh, Jane has a question or a comment. Uh, I just have two questions. Uh, that um, suggestion came from the public hearing, the suggestion that it go to children of incarcerated persons. That is not what you've been talking about today. What, so I need to know, be sure what you're talking about today. And then with what you are talking about today, are you talking about changing the, the the bill in part B only changed the unclaimed property, unclaimed restitution funds held by the Department of Corrections. Are you talking about changing both types of unclaimed restitution funds, those held by the prosecutor and those held by the Department of Corrections? Isn't the section of the bill just talking about the ones held by the DOC? The changes were only made with regard to DOC. Right, then this, the bill that's in front of us, the changes are only made with regards to the DOC. Correct. I think that's that's certainly what I'm talking about. So that's I don't wanna make any larger. About. Yeah, just this very exactly. small amount. It's not a very big amount of money. And it's, as far as I remember, and it's not that larger pool. This is very specific to the DOC. I, that's where I'm on board. I wouldn't be on board with the other one. That's, okay. what, the, that's what the motion was. For, for, that's the part of the change in part B it was. Got it. Okay. Okay, next I have Senator DeChambeau. No, oh, uh, I'll, I'll just, what she just said, it's not going to children, it's going to the IBF? Yes. Okay, thank you. Senator Searway. So um, just a question to John Pelletier. Um, <clears throat> on, on this, uh, what we're trying, from what you've heard us say, of saying, you know, uh, we'd like this money to go to the treasurer of unclaimed property and I don't know what the time period is that they hold it for unclaimed property before it goes to general. 
decide to go to general fund, but that's where we want it to go to, to the, uh, the IVF fund at that point. So I don't know what the years are or anything like that. Do you know? I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen the response from uh, Treasurer Beck. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Jane, please. I do know. And the information <laughs> is in the back of your bill analysis. It's entitled 33, section 2061, subsection 10, property held by a government, and it's one year. And thank you to Treasurer Beck for telling us that. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Treasurer Beck. Great work, Jane. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Any other comments, questions, concerns, or complaints? All right, seeing none, do we, everyone good on the motion? Understand the motion? Okay, looks like it. Deb, would you like to call the roll? Certainly. Thank you. Um, video on, please, and unmute for roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Lookner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costine. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau. Yes. The motion passes with nine yes and four absent. Good work, committee. And thank you. No divided report under the hammer. <laughs> I don't have to talk about this again. Thank you. Nice work, everyone. I'm really you did proud a good of job us. there, Mr. Pelletier. Thank you. <laughs> you gave us a big challenge. I have to go. Um, see you next week. Monday. Have a nice weekend, Senator. Bye. Bye. -bye. Are you even on a jet plane? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's take one before we go to seven ten. Let's take a little bit of a shorter bill. Give ourselves a little break here. Let's go to 1192. It still has to do with CLAC. This is an act concerning the composition of the Criminal Law Advisory Commission. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. Sure. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Representative Costain has a question. I was going to make a motion, but I can wait till she That's gets That's fine. No, no, go right ahead. <laughs> I make a motion on not to pass. I'll second. It. Not that to cut you off, but. Who got the second? No need, no need. Okay, great. Uh, Deb, would you like to call the roll? Or excuse me, is there any discussion on the motion on the floor? Okay, Deb, would you like to call the roll? Thank you. Yes, first, who got that second? I heard two people at once. I think I did, I'm not sure. Works for me. Great. Um, Um, cameras on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. 
Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent. So that is uh, eight yes and five absent. The motion passes. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so our final CLAC related bill is LD 710. Um, and then we remember that we have five more bills after um, these. Um, 710, an act regarding the main criminal code. Um, John, Mr. Pelletier, did you want to add anything about these, this bill? Uh, uh, no, I have nothing specific. Uh, we weren't, uh, I don't recall that we were asked for specific information or to, uh, uh, to bring anything back to, to my panel. I do uh, recall there was some uh, fair amount of discussion at the first work session. Right, great, thank you. Jane, did you want to add anything about this bill? So uh, perhaps Deb could bring up the bill oh, summary great. on it. Or thank you. Um, what what the only thing I would really bring to your attention is that in the public hearing, Mr. Pelletier presented a new Part G. Uh, as a, an amendment for the bill. So could you scroll down to G, Deb? It's at the end. There you go. So this was a proposal from CLAC um, to be added to the bill to respond to a U main Supreme Court ruling. So I'll, I'll leave you there. Great, thank you. All right, questions from the committee or comments from the committee? Um, I'll just bring in that I'm with Representative Reckett um, around her opposition to part A um, and her concerns around part A really had to do with women that were in relationships that were abusive um, and that that statute adding that part A would put them at a disadvantage would be used against those women. Um, so I would like to propose right from the beginning that we remove section A from the bill. Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Is John, yeah, John's still there with us, yep. with us, John. Uh, would you, uh, would you give us a recap uh, of the reasoning for the change in Part A? Yes, Part, part A came to us, um, and it's, it, it's one of the relatively rare instances where we're advocating for an increased classification of crime. And it was, it was because, uh, the circumstances that were brought to our attention that led to this proposal were not the type of circumstance that Representative Warren uh, just referenced, but they were circumstances where uh, uh, parents were basically, the circumstances we heard about, the parents were incapacitated as a result of drugs and a child died, two instances. And the, the parents played no active role in causing the death of the child. But it was clear that had they been present and attentive, the death of the child had not ha would not have happened. And the, uh, the prosecutors who were faced with these circumstances looked at the criminal code 
and found that the only thing they could charge them with was endangering the welfare of a child. And that was a class D crime. And the thought that was brought to us was that in circumstances where you, that you, there's an endangering and there's the death of a child, uh, a class D crime didn't appear sufficient. And so we crafted a class, a class C version where if you commit an endangering and as a result, a child dies or suffers serious bodily injury, then uh, it's a class C crime rather than a class D crime. So that was the reasoning behind our, our thought was we had confronted these situations with that had very serious consequences and the code under the circumstances uh, did not present what the people who brought it to us and what our panel found was an appropriate criminal justice response because it was a class D, only a class D crime was available. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Pelletier, could you also answer the question about what Representative Reckett, the concern Representative Reckett brought up is? Um, yes, well, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, I was just looking through my book and I didn't find it, but I think there is a specific statute that addresses a situation where uh, repeated abuse of a child is known, you know, the man is abusing the child and the woman knows about it. And, and I think there's a specific crime related to that. That crime, uh, uh, that circumstance that I just, that hypothetical that I just described uh, was not, did not come up in our discussion. Uh, thinking about it, it occurs to me that uh, it could uh, potentially, the new statute could potentially apply in that situation. Um, but I, uh, like I say, I thought, uh, my thoughts would be a little clearer if I was able to find that other statute that I think I'm, I'm, uh, I think applies directly. But in any event, uh, I think, I, I, I don't disagree that theoretically, the new proposal could be applied in that in the situation that Representative Reckitt was concerned about. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that information. Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is not a question uh, for Mr. Pelletier, but um, a comment on this section of the bill. You know, when I think about the, the purpose of the code um, for deterrence, for punishment, for rehabilitation, you know, I, I don't see this increasing this crime for this extreme tragedy, which, you know, may have happened two times in the last 10 years is going to deter. And when I think as a parent, um, punishment for something that tragically happens to your children, I, I can't think of anything worse than being responsible for something like that happening. And, and having that be on my, my conscience for the rest of my life. So I'm, I'm just not sure. And then considering Representative Reckitt's concerns with her domestic violence experience and how that could impact um, those folks. I'm, I'm not in, in favor of it. And, you know, and I get that the prosecutors didn't have a, a, a harsher tool that they wanted in those two, two instances, but I question whether do we make do we make laws because of that? Thank you. You bring up, uh, you just jogged my memory of when we did discuss this in CLAC. And I remember one of the justices, I don't remember if it was Judge Anderson or, or Judge Moskowitz saying that they also believed that the death of a child was probably within itself punishment more than we could ever give to someone. Um, and and I, I do remember that conversation happening in CLAC. Senator Searway. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I I think this this actually is warranted. Um, I've seen uh, families, not just the immediate family, but the family on the outside, all affected um, from something like this and tragic things happening. And um, and there should be a consequence um, greater than just um, uh, class D crime. I think that, uh, you know, my, I, I've seen, uh, well, my son adopted two children from uh, situations at home where they couldn't take care of the kids and abuse was happening from drug abuse. And, and so I can see where this, this would be warranted and I, I'd have to vote for this. I think it's a good, a good part that they came up with. Thank you. Okay, others? Other comments about the bill in general or this particular section in particular? Seeing none, does anybody have a motion or other changes you'd like to make? Senator Searway. I'd make a put motion ought to pass. Do we have a second of that motion? Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Are we only talking about part A right now or are we talking about the entire bill? He just made a motion for the entire bill. Okay. But it looks like we don't have a second, so the motion dies. Uh, Jane. No, thank oh. you. Okay. Representative Morales, do you have your hand up? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. I apologize. No, oh, that's fine. Um, I was wondering if we could have uh, more of an explanation of parts uh, E and F to remind us, and maybe that's from Jane, just remind us of our conversation around E and F, or maybe that's Mr. Pelletier briefly, because um, I know we discussed it all. I'd be happy to pass to uh, Mr. Pelletier. Uh, e, is, uh, e is just a... Uh... Uh, housekeeping measure. There was some ambiguity in uh, uh, the how you calculate the running of a period of probation, like right. when does probation commence. And so uh, section E1 says that if probation starts after you've served the prison term, then the day you're released is the first full day of probation. It doesn't matter if you're released at nine in the morning or Eight in the after, uh, eight in the evening. It's uh, the day your release counts as the first full day, and it's it has uh, one, uh, two, three, four uh, of those. Um, just clarifying how you count the days on the running of probation. And can I just ask you a question? Is that all right, Madam Chair? Yes, please. From the defense attorney side, um, does this impact? Uh, from, your, from the discussion that you had, was there opposition to this um, on the defense side of things? Uh, no, the, the uh, I'd say the, 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 there are three or four changes. The first change is beneficial for, for the, uh, for the defendant because they could get a full day's credit for half a day. Um, the others are, are pretty much neutral. The, the, the half a day goes the other way, but it's, it's um, you know, the, the um, for example, if you get arrested for a probation violation, the probation is told. So the probation doesn't run the time, of, you know, you get two years probation. The two years stop running until you, until it's done. So it says the day you get arrested is the first day of the tolling period. Right. So okay. they're they're basically neutral. They're just 
the, the, which way do you split the half days or you don't want to bother with what, what time of day an event occurred, that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think in terms of, if you don't mind, Madam Chair, the, Please. to a couple other of the sections yeah. um, in part F, we were talking about for um, sex crimes, uh, talking about mens rea and whether we were going to go with the, you know, the very highest standard of knowing whether a person consented to the contact, the sexual contact. And I think some of us were discussing, well, what if, you know, the uh, perpetrator is, the defendant is intoxicated, then that maybe would be the defense against the knowing, the very high knowing standard. However, that could, that still, we were feeling that was still reckless. Um, and so I think I would, I would be more inclined to support uh, that por portion if it were reckless standard versus a knowing standard. Uh, and I recall that discussion uh, pretty much as you just laid it out. Um, the, uh, the knowing standard is a, is, uh, yeah, by, by including a lesser culpable, cul lesser state of mind for uh, culpability, um, it would cover additional situations, just as you described. So, so far proposed taking out section A, making the change to section F from knowing to reckless. Okay. And then what about, I was looking at part B and I'm now remembering that there is an amendment brought to us as far as I remember, and Mr. Pelletier or others, correct my memory if I'm wrong, as far as I remember, this statute fix within the CLAC bill this year and last year is aimed to fix something that happened at the law court. And, oops, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes, that's correct. It is, it is as a result of, as a, it is as a result of a law court decision, that's why we brought it up. The law court decision addressed two things. One, criminalizing sexualized contact, conduct between youngsters who are close in age, because that is to a large extent normative behavior. Mm -hmm. And whether very young people should be charged with the offense of Girl sexual assault when they themselves are below the age of uh, the, the, the age cut off for uh, it, what's in essence statutory rape when they're below 14. And we, the, what our proposal addresses two of the, one of those things, because it says that to charge the crime, the, uh, to charge the crime, there needs to be a three year difference between the person charged and the alleged victim. The, uh, in the discussion, my recollection is that there was a proposed amendment to address the other prong that the law court had mentioned, which was about prosecuting very young children. And the amendment would have added, not only does the actor have to be three years older, but the actor has to be at least 14 years of age, if, my, if I recall it correctly. And we did hear from, uh, there was a, allowed in the discussion, uh, uh, DA Collins, who was not in favor of that change, uh, but that's, that's my recollection of the discussion and Jane can correct me if I got that wrong. Okay, thank you. It looks like you didn't get that wrong. And Representative Morales. Thank you. Um, quick question, uh, Mr. Pelletier. If we were to make this change, which I believe I am in favor of addressing both issues, um, the, um, there still could be uh, a charge, right, for sexual assault for a, a child who's under 14. It just wouldn't be gross sexual assault. Isn't that right? Well, uh, there could be there could be a charge of gross sexual assault that was proven not by age but by proven proving facts that 
uh, constitute compulsion. So oh. the person, you know, it what forcible rape. Um, in our statute, that's called a sexual act as a result of compulsion. And you could still prove that. Uh, and in fact, you could still prove the variant where the um, other person has not impliedly or expressively acquiesced. So you would have other gross sexual assault alternatives, but the statutory rape version, the, 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 the fact that it's criminalized because the other person is under 14, you could not charge a person who themselves were under 14 uh, with that variant if the proposed amendment were to pass. That's right. Uh, that makes very good sense to me. Um, the, the, the crime still exists and the crime could still be brought. However, it would not be a sort of a strict liability statutory rape. You'd have to bring the elements of the crime and have it be adjudicated. That, that's correct. It would, it would, for someone, if both, if both people were under 14, then you wouldn't have an age-based crime. Right. You could have a crime based on other details of the conduct. Okay, thank you. Yes, Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Boutier, your uh, amendment on Part G, would you just go over that for us? Yeah, uh, on Part G, we have, uh, you'll remember, uh, Representative Pickett, that for many years we've had in our statute a statute that says, if uh, you have a, a fatal accident, someone has died, or it's very you know, probable cause that someone is likely to die, uh, you can test, uh, you, we have a mandatory test with respect to the driver, uh, the, all, all of the drivers, as far as I read that statute. The uh, law court ruled that that statute is unconstitutional. So the bill repeals that statute. The bill puts in the regular implied, there, there was, in the law court case, they took blood from someone who was unconscious. So the person couldn't consent or not. In the old statute, this, the, the mandatory uh, blood test in fatals, uh, there was a provision that said, if you know someone has, it's a mandatory test, someone has a duty su to submit. If they don't submit, they lose their license for a year. The, okay, now under the regular implied consent statute, if for a first refusal, you, you, you lose your license for 275 days. So we suggest we're repealing outright the law that had the mandatory test in fatals, but we've added to the implied consent statute that if you have probable cause that the person was impaired and you have probable cause that someone died and the person still refuses, their suspension is 365 days instead of 275. So we preserve the one year, the one year uh, penalty for the refusal. And I did get a question last time about that and the U.S. The, the state of the law in front of the U.S. Supreme Court is that these mandatory tests without a warrant are unconstitutional, but uh, suspending a license for a refusal is not, at least at this point. And so we just and but all of the other aspects of Maine's implied consent law would apply now to a, a case where someone not only had PC that they were impaired, but you had PC that someone had died and uh, that, that they're, they're, the one year penalty for a refusal is maintained. Thank you. And I think it's not lost on everybody that I hate that part. I've made that extremely clear over and over. But I will give up on that in order to work towards us getting to uh, a place where we come to the middle, as we often have to do. Um, I still don't like it, though. 
Other, uh, Representative Pickett, do you still have your? Okay, Representative Morales. Yes, so I think we've gone over every part, right? We've discussed every part. Okay, um, so I'm gonna make a motion of ought to pass as amended. And this is what um, is in the motion. So it removes part A. It includes part B with the MACDOL amendment of uh, for children 14 and under no gross sexual assault, assault based on um, statutory rape age alone. It keeps, well, we haven't discussed part C actually. That, that's a housekeeping where in uh, the uh, section 393 of Title 15, which is the uh, basically the felon in possession statute, there's a lot of other criteria, but it's, it's, it's the criteria where people are prohibited, the statute where people under main law are prohibited from having a firearm. And it dealt with uh, jurisdiction, other jurisdictions uh, in manners that were internally inconsistent. So we made it consistent by substituting the phrase another jurisdiction, which has a clear definition. And this also allows uh, people who have DV convictions in um, uh, tribal court, uh, they would under main law lose their right to own a firearm, just like if they were convicted in the district court. And does other jurisdictions include other states as well? Other states, the federal government, territories, tribes, yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay, I'm gonna continue with my motion. Sorry for the pause, you guys. Um, so the motion is ought to pass as amended. It removes part A. It includes part B with the MACDOL amendment. It includes part C, part D and part E. Part F, um, the state of mind for culpability is uh, is reckless, not knowing. Oh. And, and then it includes part G. I'll second. Yes, Jane. I, I, I just wanted to know, and I, maybe we need some advice from Mr. Pelletier, but on part F, if you move to recklessly, do you want to include recklessly or knowingly? Uh, if, uh, Jane, if uh, uh, under the law, if a statute calls for a lesser uh, okay. culpability, proof of a higher culpability satisfies the lesser one. Okay, great. Thank you. So Thank just you. recklessly Thank is you. fine? My, my off the cuff suggestion is, and the actor acts recklessly with respect to whether the other person has acquiesced or okay. something like okay. that. And with, with respect. Yes, Jane, please. And did you uh, mention what you wanted to do with part G? Yes. Include it. Include it. Okay. Include it. So there's a motion on the floor made by Representative Morales, seconded by Representative Warren, Rep and we'll open it up for discussion. Representative Pickett. Yeah, just uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just before we uh, we take the vote on that, good, uh, good, John, if you would, could you uh, could you speak to the MACDL, uh amendment for part? I believe it was on part B. I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but I think what it says, if you look at the language in uh, uh, line 22 of the bill, and I think it, it would be amended to read, so, so line 21 reads, the other person, not the actor's spouse, is not in fact attained the age of 14 years, and the actor, that's the defendant, or the juvenile, or the person charged, and the actor, is at least 14 years of age and at least three years older than the other person. So that 
under this age-based crime, you could not be charged uh, unless you were uh, you uh, unless you were 14 or older and more than three years older. But if you were 13, as Rep. Morales asked, and you did a compulsion rate, there was the evidence proved a compulsion rate, you could be charged with that. But you wouldn't be charged, if you were 13, you wouldn't be charged strictly as a result of age uh, if the other person, say, was, uh, was 10. And your recommend, your, and then uh, the actual bill here, uh, the, di the difference, the difference is that uh, the age is 14 and gross, uh, for gross sexual assault of a victim under age 14, it's a class A and for uh, gross sexual assault of a victim under age 12, the requirement that the actor is at least three years older than the victim. So it's, it almost falls in line with what you proposed, correct? It, 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 it is consistent with what we proposed and it's consistent with the, with the um, law court opinion that brought this whole thing to our attention. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing none. Deb, would you like to call the roll? Oh, I'm, hold on one second, Deb. Senator Searway. I, uh, I do, I do like uh, A, but I will for the for the group. I will go with the, the amendment. I do think that uh, the rest of the amendment's good too, so I'm not not gonna hold strong on that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Ready. Um, video on, please, and unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckett is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costine. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Yeah. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is also absent. That's eight yes, five absent. The motion passes. Great, thank you all. Great work, John. Thank you. Well, th thank you, folks, and uh, I'll I, I've heard you, and uh, uh, future clack bills uh, won't uh, cobble <laughs> together too many unrelated things in the future. <laughs> thank we got through them, but it was not easy. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks again, folks. Have a nice weekend. You too. Okay, let's. See. See, we got rid of that one. Yay, we're done. Madam yes. Chair? <laughs> yes, Representative Pickett. Um, if I can make a suggestion uh, on these bills, I believe we have uh, four more, four more left here, and they're all on the same, on the, on the same, uh, as far as the disciplinary authority of the Board of Trustees. If we could take 400 first, and 1092 second, and then I think we may be able to do something with 513 and 505. So four, you want to go 400, then 1092, then 505, then 513? Yep. Yep. Okay, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll start with LD400. Oh my goodness, if you guys could see my desk right now, I'm going to find these bills. I think we all totally understand. <laughs> I miss Deb so much. <laughs> all right, I'm ready whenever you're ready, Jane, for LD 400. Okay. If uh, Deb could bring up the 
bill analysis. This a bill analysis. It, it it probably easier if you look at it on your own screen. But um, I did it for all four of the bills. But the first thing I started with was I tried to make an outline of who were the members of the criminal law, the criminal justice academy board of trustees. So it doesn't look like this in the statute. In the statute, it's all mashed into one section and it's all in there together. So he, this is an outline of who are the current members uh, by their positions of the Criminal Justice Academy Board of Trustees. And LD 400 proposes to add one more member who is a county commissioner who has is not and has never been a sworn member of a law enforcement agency, period. That's it, that's the only proposal. Thank you, Jane. And could you just tell us again what, I remembered 1092. Oh, I was thinking of Representative Ricketts. Okay, um, excuse me for that. Representative Costain. I make a motion not, not to pass. Seconded. I see what you're doing. I thought you wanted to work the two that you wanted first, but no. you want to kill a couple bills. Yes. Okay, so here's where I, what I'm going to ask. Um, I, I agree with you all on a couple of bills that I think we probably are in agreement on, which is Representative Reckett's bill as she amended it and Representative McRae's bill. Uh, sorry, that is 513 and 505. Okay, I think we're in agreement on those. But additionally, I feel like we need to take a further step around some transparency of employment records. And what I mean specifically is when there is a, um, a disciplinary action, I think that, that should, there should be more transparency to that similar to what happens in every other profession. Um, you know, I think that we've learned a lot. Um, you know, I remember even Kevin Joyce, when he was here, Sheriff Joyce, excuse me, he shared that although he had reported some information to the Criminal Justice Academy, it wasn't shared. And, I think that that should be shared. Um, I think that also for officers that have been decertified by the Criminal Justice Academy, that should be publicly shared in the same way that every once in a while I see in the newspaper that a dentist has been decertified, right? Or as a social worker, it's very important that we are transparent if folks are practicing uh, in a way that gets them into trouble and they lose their certification. I think that we need to put the guardrails on what needs to be included in disciplinary records. Um, so those are some thoughts that I have. I'll stop there, but how does that land with you all of instead of killing these other bills, 41092 that we use those to do some of this needed work. And I'll stop. Representative Costain first. Yeah. I don't see why we can't uh, work some of that stuff into the two final bills that we're looking at. Okay. So why don't we then work those bills? and work those things in and then kill off the things that we think we don't need. How do you guys feel about that? Representative Pickett. 
Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, the things that you're talking about and discussing there, uh, we have bills right now that we have in committee, other bills that are dealing with those issues right now. And I think that to when we're talking about, about this here, the, the, board of, the, the Board of Trustees of the Academy they have things that they deal with and, and those, are, those are all spelled right out for us. And I think they do a good job at dealing with those things. And I think these other things that you're discussing are necessary, but I think we have the, the uh, tools to be able to put those things into place on bills that are forthcoming. C case in point, we've got the two bills we're trying to work with Representative Corey and uh, Senator Merriman in, in the bills that we got, I believe for maybe next week, I'm not sure, but we got those. So we got other opportunities to take care of the issues that you have. I just think with these, with these two bills here, just my, my, my understanding here, what I'd like to see happen, I think that we can find some common ground in the two bills in Representative McRae's bill and Representative Records bill to do what I think the Board of Trustees, I personally think needs, and that's help along the lines of the investigative committee by putting a couple more people on that. And then at the same time, he's got a, he's got a part M, uh, Representative McRae's got a part M that deals with disciplinary in there that will also help out too. Then that way there we get this taken care of, and then we work those other bills to deal with some of the issues that you're talking of. And the Academy, based on though that information from those bills and how those come out of our committee, they will have to act upon those, anything that applies to them and their certifications. That's my take on it. I appreciate that. Thank you, Representative Pickett. Senator Searway. Oops, you're on mute. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with uh, Representative Pickett on what he was saying. Um, you know, and, and, and in regards to law enforcement, it's very much like teachers. I mean, uh, you don't hear anything about somebody decertified or what they did in the school to get fired most of the time. Oh, yes, uh, but, you very much do. You very much do, Senator. But yeah. keep going. Okay, but I, I, I don't hear it much in our, our SAD 49 or whatever. But uh, anyway, but... Uh, I'm just saying that uh, it, it, I think, you know, this bill isn't really uh, so much dealing with the intricacies as what we're, we're trying to put the personnel to do the job. And I think that's, that's the thing. And I think that um, we have three civil uh, civilians in uh, the board of trustees already. Uh, and I'll, and I think that uh, this, these other two bills that we were looking at of getting rid of, I think 505 and 513 should be able to cover what we're looking at trying to do. Okay, thank you, Senator. I hear what you guys are saying and I'm willing to make a compromise. Let's kill LD 400, work 505 and 513, but I'd like to keep 1092 open so that we still have a vehicle left. So that's a compromise I'd like to offer. Are you asking me? <laughs> I'm sorry, anybody. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Madam. Chair, I didn't, the I only person I'm not asking is myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I didn't. I stepped away from the desk for a minute. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you had to say. Okay, I was just saying I would be willing to compromise and kill LD four hundred, and then work five hundred five and five thirteen but I'd like to leave at least one bill for an opportunity to, as we find what we need to put in there. So that would be my, my um, offer of a compromise. Whatever's gonna get the afternoon done. 
<laughs> okay, so we have a motion on the floor. I'm going to get to Representative Morales. Um, no, we have a. Oh, you're good. Okay. Uh, okay, we have a motion on the floor ought not to pass on LD 400, and there was a second by Representative Costain. Am I right about that, Deb? I thought I have that Costain made oh, the motion yeah. and Pickett seconded. Yes, you you are right. I am wrong. Okay, great. So we have a motion on the floor. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? Okay, seeing none, Deb, would you call the roll? Certainly. Um, cameras on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent. The motion passes with eight yes and five absent. Wonderful, thank you, Deb. Okay, so, and which one did you guys want? Oh, I wrote it down. So that takes care of LD 400 and we're gonna leave 1092 just for a little bit here. And now we're gonna move to LD 505 an act to expand the disciplinary authority of the board of trustees. And this is uh, representative McRae's bill. Um, Jane, did you wanna do a quick overview of this for us? Uh, it's just, we're on 505. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, I think if you scroll down, Deb, to D, there it is. Yep. This is from LD 505 D, proposal to increase disciplinary authority of the board. So Representative McRae brought a, a, a proposed amendment to the public hearing and it proposes to authorize the board to adopt rules establishing disciplinary standards of conduct for an applicant or certificate holder and to authorize the board to take action against an applicant or certificate holder who engages in conduct that is in violation of those disciplinary standards of conduct. Um, the um, the amendment that he brought to the public hearing had uh, had those two things in it, and it makes clear that uh, it does two things. One requires the um, board to adopt rules establishing the standards of conduct, and two provides to the board the authority to take action against an applicant for violate for uh, um, conduct in violation of the standards of conduct. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Okay, up next, I see Representative Pickett. Representative Costain, do you mean to have your hand up? I don't, sorry. Okay. That's okay. Representative Pickett. Yes, Madam Chair. I think that uh, this particular bill here uh, with the amendment that was made uh, that took and strike, struck the bill altogether, the language of the bill, and then added M, engaging in conduct that is a violation of the disciplinary standards of co conduct established by the board by rule pursuant to section 2803-A, subsection 15-A to the list of things here, grounds for action. I think that that, is, uh, that was a, a good uh, move on Representative McRae's part. I'm glad that he saw fit to do that. And I, I move ought to pass as amended. We have a motion on the floor, ought to pass as amended. 
Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Newman, thank you. I would like to offer a friendly amendment um, and let's see how this lands for you all. Um, I support how the bill has been amended, but in addition, I would like to add that the record, that the action taken by the Criminal Justice Academy against the certification holder become public. And that in that public record, it's more than just the synopsis or the summary, that there's actually more of a disciplinary record of what led to that, uh, that result. Just looking at my the notes I've been taking while we've been talking, excuse me. Yeah, so those are the two things that if you folks agree, I'd like to add. Um, Representative Morales. Oh, Richard, did you wanna, I mean, Representative Pickett, did you wanna weigh in on that? If you'd I'm be just willing. Gonna, I was just gonna say that uh, Representative Costain got tied up for a minute. He, won, he wondered if you could just uh, repeat what you had to say again, please. Of, of course I can. So in addition to the authorization of the board to take action against an applicant or certificate holder, I would like to add that the record in that that become public, that the, it makes the action taken by the Maine Criminal Justice Academy a public matter and that the record includes more than just the synopsis or summary, but includes what caused the disciplinary action. So more transparency leads to more oversight um, is my thinking in those motions um, or those, my attempt to get a friendly amendment to your motion. Uh, Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am in favor of uh, an amendment like that. And I'll, I think I've mentioned to you all um, that I used to practice professional licensing, um, doctors and nurses and social workers and engineers. And that's exactly what's done um, on disciplinary matters um, for those boards, the over 45 professional boards in the state of Maine. Because in order to, um, you know, I think as it would, would read the public, you know, for example, when you're, you're choosing a, a doctor, or you're choosing an engineer, you would be able to go and look at whether or not this person you're choosing has uh, disciplinary action, which includes the basis, the findings upon which the disciplinary, disciplinary action was taken. So I think it makes a lot of sense. It's consistent with all the other professions um, in the state of Maine, particularly for my profession as a lawyer, um, all of it is public. Um, and so I think it's just in line with what we do for other professions. I would also, and I don't know, I don't think I was here for the hearing on this, but did we talk about whether this bill includes oversight over sheriffs as well? And could that be an amendment um, that folks would be interested in adding? Um, and then does this bill also talk about a code of conduct that um, the board would um, would come up with in terms of dis disciplinary measures that are not purely just based on crimes that are already in existence, but sort of a standard code of practice, just like other professions have. So I know it's a lot of stuff to discuss and I actually have to go in the car, so I will be on audio. Okay, let me quickly give you, so the first thing you were agreeing of my ask for a friendly amendment. The second thing, yes, we did talk about sheriffs and Representative Pickett and Senator Kime both have bills dealing with that issue. I've looked at both of them, they're great. Okay. Representative Pickett sent them to me. They're over in state and local, so we don't need to worry about that here. Right. And the third part about the code of conduct, I think that's a great example of why I'd like to keep Senator Miramont's bill because if, if folks don't agree to put it in this one, maybe that's a place to put it, but maybe folks will agree with it here. So I know you have to go, but I just wanted to, to say that to you. Representative Pickett. 
Well, can I just follow quickly before I go off on the code okay. of conduct piece? Um, and I, my thinking is not that we would develop that code of conduct, but no, that the board would develop the code of conduct. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. We would require that it be developed. Great. Thank you. Um, Senator, uh, Representative Pickett. Yes, Madam Chair, an answer to that question uh, about the code, of, the code of conduct. There is already an established police code of conduct uh, that is upheld and in, in probably in every police department that I know of in the state uh, that uh, officers are, are, are held under. And that's something that we, not other, just like any other profession, we take, a, we take a, a stand in that. We have a code of conduct. We have a code of ethics that we go by. So I don't really see why we need to put those into codify them in law. May I ask you a follow-up question, Representative? Certainly. In addition to them being at individual, uh, in individual police departments, is there also a code of conduct expectation at the Criminal Justice Academy that is part of certification or decertification or warning. And I see we, we have Director Destardens here and I forgot we should have him in here. Yep, and that I would, think that would be a good question for him. Thank you. And I apologize. If Could you bring in Director Destardens? And I also know we have Director Gilmet here um, and maybe we should bring him in as well. Welcome, Director Desjardins, and welcome, <laughs> Director Gilmet. And I think you both are probably have heard the discussions that we've been having. Director Desjardins, could you answer the question of the committee that has to do with um, if there is a code of conduct as part of the review or um, certification holder violation process, et cetera. I know I'm not using the right language, so I'm going to stop and let you talk. <laughs> so, yeah, and again, Madam Chair, thank you for uh, for allowing me just to speak uh, briefly. Um, so there is a there is a code of conduct and a and a code of ethics that we use here at the academy for cadets and people who are attending the programs. Um, but currently, the the statute that we are operating under uh, that allows us to decertify a license holder or take an action uh, does not include uh, some behaviors that I think everyone agrees has, um, has, a, has a, a place for um, an action that the board would take. And what we're agreeing with and we'd hope to do, and it's been a, a you know, I've been here at the academy for several years, but the director for 10 months. But one of my initiatives is to um, move this board, and they've given me um, great uh, support in this action, is to, is to go into rulemaking and to actually start to um, ad adopt standards that the board can take action against for conduct that isn't currently uh, listed under the chapters that we can take an action against. And, and we're, we're quite frankly excited to do that and, and frustrated at times uh, when we are unable to take an action against an officer's credential uh, when there's clearly uh, conduct and uh, in something that we would like to deal with. Um, so again, I, I, just, I just wanted to leave that uh, as, a, as an opportunity. And if I could just briefly, uh, Madam Chair, respond to the, the question you had about the issues of whether or not um, at the result of an action that the board takes against a credential holder. Uh, it has been the practice for the last several years. We have a great attorney uh, from the attorney general's office that represents our board. And, 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 and I fully agree that the previous agreements were very um, summarized and not very uh, deep in, in, in the factual information about why the board finally took an action, but that's not been the practice of recent. And those actions are public uh, and they do, in some cases, list very carefully the facts of the case and what the board's actions were uh, as a result. If, there's a, if there is a, um, a, a 
an action the board takes, or in some cases, a decertification. And those decertifications, we enter into a national database. And, and those are something we, we do as a, as a, as a practice. And, and uh, we, we've been doing that for quite some time now. Super helpful. Follow-up question for you, Director. Thank you. So all of that that you just said would, um, would correspond to all levels of law enforcement. We'll put sheriffs over there for right now, different group, but that would be municipal law enforcement, state police, reserve and officers, everybody who's officers, certified. Anyone that we certify um, has the same um, risks and responsibilities to maintain that standard. And we uh, did nine cases today we worked on with the CRC uh, that were, you know, ultimately we'll work through the process. But yeah, those are, those are a combination of every credential holder that we have. Is the national database public? It is, um, that's a great question. No, it is not public. What, and I'm the certifying officer in the state. So we've, and been publicizing this for, for quite some time now, um, agencies are uh, encouraged strongly to check particularly it, officers that are being, they're applying for um, in-state certification from other, other states. Uh, so those are, those are issues that we, you know, we, we certainly would love to see a more robust public listing of offices decertifications. Uh, but again, that does, that the national database right now is, 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 uh, cut off, you have to have permission to get in to see those, um, those decertification um, cases. Got it, okay, thank you for that. And so what I'm hearing, if I may just summarize, is that these particular, these three particular things that we've asked about are either already happening or are in the pipeline to happen and so you would support them being in statute. Absolutely. Great. And again, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a terrific, you know, again, another example of how, you know, I think this, this committee can really support us in moving uh, into that rulemaking process. Wonderful, Director. Thank you. Uh, other questions of the committee for, and welcome, Director Gilmet. It's good to see you as well. Would you like to add anything currently? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I, I think um, Director Deschardins uh, covered it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee from either Director Deschardins or Director Gilmet? Yes, Senator Searway. If I uh, just asking if uh, to Jane, I guess, um, if if we are going to put something in statute to reflect what the rulemaking is of what uh, uh, Director Disjardins mentioned, maybe we could have something that matches up with it. Thank you. Great, okay, Representative Costain. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not familiar with uh, Director Gilmatt. Could you tell us what he does and what his credentials are? Absolutely, yes, Director Gilmatt, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm sorry, he's been with us before, but maybe sometimes he doesn't have the camera on. Uh, yes, my name is Dave Gilmatt. I'm the Director of Enforcement Anti-Theft and regulation at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles for the Secretary of State's office. And I've been in law enforcement now for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. So how are folks feeling about, and I guess specifically Representative Pickett, you have a motion of ought to pass as amended. And we have asked for three additional friendly amendments to your amendment. Are you willing to take those on? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as I was going 
down through them in my head and uh, deciding on whether or not I would uh, entertain them as part of the motion. I was glad to see that the director was here because where they directly involved the academy and what they're trying to do and now with their uh, desire to want to get rulemaking and, and tighten up some things, uh, if they're okay with it, then I certainly am okay with it as well. Wonderful, thank you. And who was the second? Senator Searway? Senator, uh, uh, Representative thank, Newman. Representative, Representative Newman. Newman, excuse yeah. me. You're okay with it as well, I'm, I'm Representative? Okay, thank you very much. Senator, please go ahead. Oh, whoops, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just wondering if you could have Jane repeat the what 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 she has for a motion just so that I understand it all because I know there's a few details in there I want to hear. Great. Well, okay. I, I and I had just put up my hand to ask the uh, the mover of the friendly amendment if she could repeat, please, the three things so we all know what they are. I'd be happy to, yes, thank you. Um, so the three things are that when we're talking about the action against an applicant or certificate holder, that additionally, the action taken becomes public, a matter of public record, that the record that becomes public includes more than just the synopsis, right? Include, excuse me, includes more than just the decision, but actually includes, uh, I think Director Desjardins may have used the term, the behavior, um, the circumstances I might I might use. Does that does that make sense, Jane, as what I'm getting at? I think he talked about the basis for the action. Yes. And, and I'm wondering if we talked about these things in terms of public records, would that help? That's what my motion is. Okay. For those two, yes, thank you for that first one and the second one. And the third was made by Representative Morales that there were either a code of conduct or a set of standards that weren't necessarily crimes committed, but they were behaviors or conduct that were part of what it meant to keep your certification as a law enforcement agent officer in Maine. And on that one, could I just ask, um, I, I, I'm not sure what the difference is between that and Representative McRae's proposal that the board adopt rules establishing disciplinary standards of conduct. Okay, okay. Is that so, um, Give me a little bit of an example and that will help. I, I think we need to talk to uh, Director Desjardins about that. Yes, please. Director, what would that included in Representative McRae's amendment? Could you give us a definition of those standards he's presenting? So again, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I think that what we're hearing from at least the board's uh, position is they would like to work that standard and, and, and create a measurable, enforceable standard that lives outside of those um, statutory authorities that we're currently um, derived from Title 25. And again, those, some of the things that we've talked about, and again, I, I, hopefully the process would work its way and, and perfect the standard, but you know, things along the lines of, um, gross deviations from standards of truthfulness, for example, uh, if a person is found to be untruthful in a, in a let's say a work um, situation, but they, it doesn't rise to the level of a crime, let's say a, a sworn or unsworn falsification, that would be something the board has shown some interest in. Um, and again, there's some you know, pretty egregious um, public things that have happened of, of late, you know, with regards to, you know, 
harassment of employees, uh, sexual harassment of employees, uh, you know, that I think shock our conscious. I think I've used that word a couple different times. And, and I think those are things that the, the board would like to tackle on trying to create a standard that's measurable and put that in our standards through uh, rulemaking and public hearings and then adopt those standards so we could take an action. Great. Great. Okay. That answers my question. Jane, does that answer your question? Well, is, is that then a number three amendment or is that already included in uh, Representative McRae's amendment? I think it's already included. Thank you, Thank you for clarifying that. Yep. Does everyone else think it's already included? Okay. Okay. Great. Thank I, you. So it's, oh yes. Senator Searway. Yeah, uh, just a clarification um, through uh, Director Desjardins. Um, I know you talked about rulemaking and how they're going to uh, develop this. And now we're talking about in statute, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how we can word what you just put in place, what you, you spoke about, and make sure it's what we're all on the same page. I don't want to end up putting something in and then they say, whoa, wait, this isn't what we talked about. You know what I'm saying? They'll, sorry, please, director. Sorry. Yeah. Again, I, I think what, what I, you know, the beauty of the chemistry and the makeup of the board is that the process to get to those standards um, does open up the public's comments and, and allows the board to kind of work through those standards to come up with those um, those rules or those standards and 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 that deliberative process to get there, I think, is going to be an important step. I, I wouldn't want to, um, you know, lead anyone to believe that we should be upfront telling what the board is going to ultimately agree on. I think the process needs to take uh, to take shape, and I think just in by virtue of this bill, uh, you know, essentially supporting the board's move toward rulemaking, I think is a huge step. It's a big step for us. And I think it's gonna be something that, that, that delivers a great product. Thank you. Senator, concerns assuaged? Well, I just wanted to, I, I just think if we can word it that way, I think that we'd be all on the same page. That's what I'm, I'm just saying. So it sounds like it's already part of the bill, the amendment that came forward by the representative. So yeah. I think that wording has already been put in there. So it sounds like we're all on the, okay. Any other comments or questions from anyone about the proposal? Yes, Representative Costain. Let's call a question to vote. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Um, uh, Deb, would you like to call the roll for us? Certainly. Um, video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative and, uh, Warren. Yes. Representative Morales is absent. Representative Reckitt is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent. That's the motion passes with seven yes and six absent. Beautiful. Good job, everyone. Okay, so we have one. Thank you, both of you for being here with us. Also, we have one bill left, which is LD 1092. And we have Senator Dave. I'm sorry, am I wrong? Yeah, 513. That? Representative Reckett's bill. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to move us along. Yes, 513. Excuse me. I can me. move us quick with a motion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you we're all set. Go for it, Representative. Representative Pickett, do you want to make a motion? Yes, thank you. On 513, uh, Representative Records Bill, I would make a motion 
ought to pass as amended. I'll second. Any discussion on the motion? Mm. Yes, Jane. Could we have a description of what the amendment is? Um, the amend yeah. yeah. The amendment is uh, putting, uh, increasing the number, not any, there's no increasing numbers of people on the board. It's just simply increasing the number from three to five. Uh, and I'll find it here in just a second. I'll probably wait in your... Right in your description. I think that's section two of the bill. Yep. I'll find it here. Find I it. think her amendment was to take out section one and just leave section two. Right. right. And, that, right. and that called for, instead of three, it called for five members of the board. Uh, I mean, not, I'll take that back for the, including at least, no, hang on a minute. It's for the, it's for the, uh, It's for the review committee. I shall appoint five members of the board to serve on the complaint review committee. That's the that's the part. The other the other part of the bill section section one was uh, was uh, struck was okay. taken out. Just section two with that dealing with the review committee complaint review committee. All good on that, Jane. All set. Didn't we just do that in five hundred five? And who seconded it? I did. Deb, would you like to call the roll? Certainly. Video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales is absent. Representative Reckett is absent. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costain. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent. The motion passes with seven yes and six absent. Perfect, thank you. Deb, would you bring in Senator Miramont? He has been here all day with us. Thank you. Senator Miramont, are you with us? He may have stepped away. So, okay, how about this? We have done a ton of work. Um, I would like to suggest that we table this bill. Um, we have, as you all suggested, we have 539 and 573 that we're gonna work next week. May take care of everything we need. But this just gives us an extra jacket in case we need it if we find that we need something. How do you all feel about that? And then we're done for today. Oh, I, uh, I feel that we probably would be okay without, without it, period. But uh, I guess if nobody else has any objections, if we want to leave it there, just, to, just in case. You okay with that? Thank you. Senator Searway. Uh, I feel the same way that the, um, you know, We've talked to the director, the students, they have 16 on the board already. We really don't need more. We've got uh, citizens on the board and everything else. I, I just don't see the need for it. And I, I don't know why we're tabling it if we don't need it. Senator Searway, I'm sorry. I probably didn't make myself clear. Let me reframe what I'm saying. I don't support that bill either. I'm not going to support the bill as it stands. I think what we've done right here about the Criminal Justice Academy gets us to where we need to be. Um, and I feel good about those proposals. Um, but I also, I'd like to look back at this work we've done today, these two bills, 
take into consideration what comes out of state and local. We've got two live bills there. I'd like to look at what happens with 539 and 573. And I don't think it hurts us to just have a vehicle that we might use. And that's literally all I'm asking, but I am with you. I am not going to vote for the way the bill is written. No way, no how. And I don't think anybody is. But it's just, it could be an empty jacket. It's all I'm saying. Does that make sense as far as a process? Yeah, I'll go along with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I can't make the motion because I've blabbed way too much. Does anybody want to make a motion to table? Make a motion to table. Second. Deb, would you call the roll on the motion to table 1092? Oops, you're on mute. I, I was sorting through all my vote sheets and I missed uh, who made the motion and who seconded. I motioned. Thank you. And Representative Newman seconded. Thank you. Um, is Representative Morales back? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, the motion is to table and Deb is gonna call the roll. Okay. Um, video on and please unmute for a roll call vote. Representative Warren. Yes. Representative Morales. Yes. We can circle back and have Representative Morales vote on those two she missed too. Um, Representative Lookner. Yes. Representative Pickett. Yes. Representative Costine. Yes. Representative Rudnicki is absent. Did I say Representative Reckett and Representative Sharper absent? Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Kluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. Yes. Senator DeChambeau is absent. That's um, eight yes and five absent. Great. Senator, sorry we were calling you, but we figured you had stepped away from, um, from your computer and no problem. We just tabled your bill. We'll be coming back to it at a date in the future. And we just finished our work. Thank you for hanging in there with us all day, Senator Merrimont. Thank you. I heard when you were talking about what to do with bills and stuff. So I was waiting and I looked away for a minute. I'm sorry, but thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank <laughs> you, Senator. Bye-bye. Bye. Committee members, thank you. You all are amazing. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Director Desjardins, Director Gilmet, thank you for being with us. And of course, Jane and Deb, thank you for all of your work this week, as always. See you all Monday at 10, right? Hey, um, can I ask a question? I missed a bill. Yeah, or we'll let you do. stay on with Deb. How does that work? Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Or do you need us here, Deb, for her to vote? I have no idea. <laughs> I'll stay. Go for it right now. I'll stay. Okay. Um, okay, so LD505, uh, the motion was ought to pass as amended by Representative Pickett and seconded by Representative Newman. It was unanimous in favor. Um, so how do you vote? Representative Morales, are you there? Oh dear. Okay, she's gonna have to vote just the way we all do because it's okay. a weekend. So okay. <laughs> yeah, she can call it in. I'll remind her to call it in, okay? okay Everybody email. good? Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.